going on everyone john matrix here so today we're going to get into uh probably the most requested video uh that you guys put out here uh luton 09's emperor of man the rise of humanity warhammer 40,000 lore and history um so yeah we're gonna get into that but before we do i just want to do a quick little announcement first of all just want to say like thank you guys like really for all the support lately on the channel with uh you know all the warhammer 40k stuff that i've been diving into you guys have shown a lot of love and a lot of support and uh it's actually tipped me over the edge and i've been able to get my channel partnered so we're we're partnered here now on youtube so uh thank you guys very much you know i, I can't say thank you guys enough it's awesome it's something i've been working for for a long time and uh, just happened a few days ago so we've got the partnerships going on uh, i've got the membership stuff set up uh if any of you guys out there want to go way above and beyond and support me monetarily uh you know there's the the youtube membership stuff that you can join um right now uh it's kind of like base level stuff i just got it set up to get it set up i've kind of got it uh uh lined up with how twitch has some of their sub tiers set up um but you know we can do a lot more with the youtube members you know stuff than we can with twitch subs there's a lot more customization so really i'm kind of gonna leave it up to you guys i want to hear your feedback on you know stuff you'd like to see uh, uh ideas for stuff that we could do for the channel stuff that you guys would like to see you know added to the different membership tiers um that we could do right now i've got it set up you know i've got you guys can join the, you know uh, some special discord channels that i've got set up um you know exclusive you know streams for the highest tier for you know maybe some some movie nights some some specific game nights for those that want to go super above and beyond um and uh you know stuff like that getting your name you know added to my videos and you know some other things but i i want to do a lot more than what's already on there but i want to obviously hear your guys feedback on that so um obviously it's not required whatsoever just coming in and hanging out and watching videos and you know leaving comments and stuff is more than enough but if anyone out there decides they want to go you know above and beyond that extra mile and they decide they want to support me monetarily there's an option for that if you guys want to um but yeah thank you guys very much for getting you know stuff partnered um we are in uh thanksgiving time here in the states for those of you in the united states who celebrate it thanks you know have a wonderful thanksgiving um it's appropriate time you know for my channel to get partnered it's something uh, very much that i have to be thankful for um but i just want to say you know for everyone out there who is celebrating thanksgiving you know have a wonderful thanksgiving stay safe if you're traveling all that stuff hope you all have a wonderful time with your families um so but the channel is probably going to be a little quiet for the next couple of days i am the cook in the in the family so i'm the one that's going to be uh, getting everything you know prepared and set up so i'm kind of busy this week already doing a lot of that but i'm definitely going to be busy all day tomorrow and then probably friday i'm just going to take a day to chill maybe even saturday um so uh for the next couple days it might be a little quiet on the channel but we did uh i did get book one of the horus heresy here i don't know i can't really see it the uh <laughs> the camera is uh you know taking it out of the background here but it's there it's there Blah, can you see hello camera ah no it's just camera's just deleting it. okay well trust me it's 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 kind of here we have the spectral version of, of horus rising book one so i'm gonna dive into that i'm gonna start diving into that this weekend uh and so hopefully next week i can uh start making you know maybe some videos uh going over you know a few chapters at a time giving you know my thoughts on those chapters reacting to those chapters if you want uh, i'm giving my thoughts on them maybe some predictions on where things go uh etc etc so i mean if you guys also want to you know read along with me you know that'd be pretty awesome you know we could do you know i don't know we could do something with that on the channel too if you guys want to you know read along while i'm doing this and you know we can have some discussions about the books etc etc i'm um, trying to find ways and things to to do to uh add my own content you know to uh the 40k universe and a lot of the other stuff that i'm interested in um most of the stuff that i'm interested in just happens to be movies and tvs and there's not really a ton of movies and tvs unfortunately for the 40k for me to really you know dive into like there is for star wars and lord of the rings and all that kind of stuff but anyway 
so we're gonna dive into that uh that's pretty much it for the announcements appreciate you guys again thank you guys very much for all the love and support i can't you know thank you always seems inadequate in these kind of situations but uh i greatly greatly appreciate it so uh, i think that's all i really have right now for the announcements so i guess let's uh let's just dive into the video here all right so like i said let's uh let's dive on in here uh this is luton 09 i hope i'm saying the name right luton um yeah emperor of man the rise of humanity warhammer 40k lore and history this is something i've actually been really looking in uh, forward to getting into some of the more deeper richer lore of the 40k universe and especially the emperor the emperor seems to be uh somewhat of a mystery for as big as of a character he is a lot of his um you know origins are i guess still really unknown it would be interesting to see if they plan to keep him that way you know kind of a, a more of an unknown figure keep his origins a mystery or if they're gonna eventually dive into that more but anyway let's just get in it in the grim darkness of the far future there is only war There once was a man, a man born in a forgotten time, created by a force of unknown origin. He would cross the ages knowing his one purpose, to lead humanity as the greatest empire in the galaxy, the Imperium of Man. In this Emperor. time, he would be known by only one name, the Emperor of Mankind. So now, this is just, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm curious. Is there any kind of comparison? I don't know if comparison is the right word, but like, I know in the Warhammer 40, or not Warhammer 40k, in the Warhammer fantasy universe, isn't Sigmar kind of somewhat similar to the Emperor? He was like the, the human that kind of really united humanity against a lot of other, you know, chaos and the other races. Aren't they kind of similar? And, you know, let me know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that and I'm thinking about something else, but let me know. No, I don't want to... Backwards, there we go. The Emperor of Mankind. The Giga Chad himself. The Giga Ist of Chads, actually. If you wanna, you know, put it that way. This is Luton. I must first apologize for the Luton. length okay. of time since the last project. The simplest explanation is it took me a long time to compile amid many other things going on for me. Yeah, I would imagine doing like super deep in-depth lore videos like this uh, on universes that are like have so much story and in, 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 in rich, you know, uh, you know, lore and history or whatever in there and in, in there like this would be a lot and it would take a long time to do this. So obviously for you guys out there that do this kind of stuff, thank you very much. I, I love 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 diving into lore videos stuff with like vadi video and um uh i think it's smotown is his name i hope i'm getting that right uh but they do a lot of you know dark souls elden ring uh lore stuff um you know and obviously you know bricky and Luton here and there's just all kinds of stuff stuff out there so thank you guys you know the dudes that take the time to do this stuff you're the real mvps is it took me a long time to compile amid many other things going on for me so we now move on from the eldar history and wade into one of the most important and oh we did one on the eldar too that'd be interesting in to get the into universe of the 41st millennium it is of course the rise of humanity and the imperium in the dark never ceasing war that is the future humans have risen to control and maintain a galaxy spanning empire whose official title is 
the Imperium of Mankind. The Imperium is the largest and most powerful political entity in the galaxy. It has been established for a period of some 10,000 years up to its present date in the age of Warhammer 40k. The lore and scripture around this period is massive. Despite this daunting task, so, so, yeah. I've decided to interpret it in one piece chronologically, splitting it okay. into chapters so as to best enable you guys to get an understanding and a grasp of what it is all about. This is the third video in my Warhammer 40,000 lore series, and it seeks to create a foundation for all of the further videos which talk about the Imperium of Man. Chapter 1, The Overview. Okay. The Imperium of Man consists of the planets, systems, and forces throughout the galaxy which contain Imperial citizens and their derivatives. There we are on Terra. All humans are universally members of the Imperium though, and as you would expect there are rogue traders and those who choose to live on the legal fringes of the society. The single most important figure within the Imperium is the aforementioned founder, saviour, and ruler of this empire known as the Emperor of Mankind. He formed the Imperium some 10,000 years previous to the current established date in the universe of Warhammer 40,000 at the end of the 30th millennium. This occurred following an especially brutal period of societal disintegration during the last days of the Age of Strife. In this video, I'll outline the political... Yeah, Bricky went over that a little bit, you know, when, uh, um, I think it was Slaanesh's birth. That started that, and there are all these disruptions in the warps, so all the planets were um, broken apart from each other and kind of had to fend for themselves since interstellar travel wasn't a thing at the time, um, you know, because of how messed up the warp became. So, uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very rough time, I would, I would assume, uh, to be living in. I mean, the 40k universe in general would be a pretty rough time to live in. I mean... Most of it is very grim and very dark and nothing but war and... Uh, like, I, I would assume there probably are pockets of areas and, you know, certain people probably do have great lives, but they're also probably... The majority of people are just nothing but, but war and, you know, constantly wondering, you know, when you're going to get killed, shot, whatever, what's going to kill you. Etc. Etc. During the last days of the Age of Strife. In this video, I'll outline the political state that is the Imperium, as well as the history behind how humanity reached this point in the far future. As with anything though, the complexity and depth of the law means I can't cover it in its fleshed entirety, so some tangents are going to have to remain for future videos, but I do my best to cover as much as possible which is relevant. The Emperor of Man sits as an extremely powerful figure within the Imperium. Make no mistake, he is the centre of humanity in the 41st millennium. So powerful a humanoid, he was arguably barely human to begin with, and he continues to protect mankind after his mortal wounding during the final battles of a period known as the Horus Heresy. Isn't that, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but isn't the Emperor, like, when he's at his prime, isn't he really, like, such a powerful psyker that he's able to really stave off, like, the Chaos Demons themselves? Isn't he, like, able to, like, in a one-on-one -on -one scenario against, like, Nurg or Zeech or Korn, isn't he able to, like, not necessarily kill them or beat them, but at least kind of stalemate them? You know, maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, I've, that's what I thought I've, I remember hearing or reading. After his mortal wounding, during the final battles of a period known as the Horus Heresy. Were it not for his ever-present psychic voice reaching out, searching, protecting and planning, then the Imperium of Man would undoubtedly fall back into dark oblivion, and perhaps the light would be extinguished permanently. The Emperor was injured so badly after the heresy that he now exists only as a husk of a man within yep. a stasis chamber called the Golden Throne. This allows him to live on eternally as he has done for some past 10,000 years whilst continually guiding mankind through psychic whispers. The only catch with this is thousands of psychers are sacrificed every day using their essence and psychic power to keep him alive as he is heavily protected and attended to back on the ancient homeworld of legend terror or old earth. The Imperium of Man in the wider galaxy now consists of many systems, planets and trillions of citizens. All the while the Imperial military and the- So, real quick, just going back to, you know, him being injured, obviously I'm gonna read it and get into that with the Horus, you know, stuff. And I know there's a ton of books into that, but, um... 
I guess the question I would have is how like is he, he how how is he injured in a way where he can't be healed? You know what I mean? Like with technology and science and how much he's progressed, like what is it about his injury that keeps him from being healed? Is it just so grievous an injury that he is not able to himself heal himself with his powers? There is there no one else in the Imperium able to heal him? You know, I, I assume I, Horus must have done something using some kind of, you know, chaos given powers or whatever to where the wound is corrupted in some way and he just can't can't be healed because i know like during the battle the emperor like literally with his mind just like deatomized him like there's just literally nothing left of horus so like, he was that much more powerful but um yeah so i guess that's the question that i really have at that point is what is preventing anything from healing the emperor and I don't know if this is like a fan theory. I think I've talked about this a little bit in some of the other videos, but from what I understand, and again, this might just be a fan theory that I've heard or read, but the Emperor's soul is supposedly immortal, so even if he dies, he would just be, he would rebirth himself, you know, at some point in time. Um, and so I guess it's also a question is, do they know that or not? You know, if that is true. You know, kind of a situation. And the many administrators of mankind, all of whom swear allegiance to the Emperor, all stand together against the nightmares of the galaxy to form what is humanity in the darkest of futures. Now we know that in this future we have access to highly advanced technology and face many voracious enemies wielding our own forces to then counter them. The important question in understanding the Imperium is how did we get to this time? And to understand this, we need to look back at the extensive and dark history of humanity. There is a small clue as to the way in which the people that constitute humanity in the 41st millennium view their past. That is, the Imperial Two-Headed Eagle, the crest of the Imperium. It stands with its two heads, but with one eye closed. Yeah, one eye closed, one eye open. Blind, or perhaps refusing to see the past. The other eye is open, looking to the looking future. Towards the future. The logic being that the past of humanity is too painful or dangerous to look back on, so we look forward, striving to be stronger and more powerful, as we have done for be thousands of years. Be better than what we are. There are distinct ages of humanity's history, and these tell the story of how we reached the time of the Imperium. One millennium equals 1,000 years. The Imperium has now been established for 10 millennia or 10,000 years. Humanity has existed for roughly 41,000 years. This timeline demonstrates the ages of man through this period from our ancient history through to the age of the Imperium. We have the ancient history, the age of terror, the golden age of technology or the dark age of technology, the age of strife, the unification wars, the great crusade and the fall of the Eldar, the Horus Heresy and the Great Scouring, followed by the final Age of Imperium of Man. Okay, so we're getting into the ancient history. Huh? The ancient history tells of the dawn of mankind, but this period is largely one of animalistic evolution. The most significant event occurs around 7000 BC. This event marks the birth of the humanoid, who would become the Emperor of Mankind. His origins are something of a heated debate among the 40k community. There are several theories around this, and it's important to note that something I rarely see stated on uh, forums or discussions around the origins of the Emperor is that quite simply no one knows the origins of the Emperor. It's all just okay. speculation. Simply okay. because one theory has had a vague reference at one time or another does not make it gospel. In fact, so I guess a lot of it is left up to interpretation, kind of like how a lot of Souls lore is, or the, they'll give you little hints and pieces of things that are fact, but then a lot of other stuff is convoluted and uh, left to interpretation. I kind of like that. I, I, I like stuff that's left open to interpretation because it offers discussion. 
Because one theory has had a vague reference at one time or another does not make it gospel. In fact, as I've repeated before, the crux of the matter with imperial history and law in general is that very little should ever be considered official or canon. Uh, such is the state of the loss of history, misinformation and suppression of facts within the 40k universe. So essentially, the correct version is the version you want to believe. In a universe where history is stored over thousands of years and in times of unimaginable devastation and strife, it's unlikely something could be considered a cold hard fact, especially when you're talking about events that happened in ancient history in an age where accurate recording of information seems unlikely or even impossible to have survived. The first version of these events is the often widely accepted background which states that in the ancient times some humans carried a natural affinity or awareness of the warp. These were the earliest psychers. They would be right. village shamans or witch doctors in ancient communities. I think this is the one that I've heard where a group of like tribal shamans saw the future. They knew what was going to happen with the chaos demons and things like that. And so they created some kind of ritual where they fused their souls together into one all-powerful being and he was reborn as the emperor and then throughout history has influenced things to get man on a specific track until he revealed himself when he needed to in you know the 30,000 you know year timeline I think that's what he's talking about here I guess you know let's find out psychers they would be village shamans or witch doctors in ancient communities. Their premonitions led them to understand that in the future, mankind would face the <coughs> darkest of times. Their decided course of action would be to commit ritual suicide en masse, yep. returning their souls and essence to the warp to then coalesce and be reborn as one supremely powerful psychic being. This being would then spend the future millennia living a Highlander-like existence, transitioning right. from identity to identity, sometimes taking on famous leaders in history to steer humanity in the right direction. Which honestly is a pretty dope origin story. You know, I mean, if you think about it, that's honestly pretty sick. You know, a group of shamans fuse their souls together into one powerful being that's essentially immortal. Um... And just throughout history, maybe he's died at certain times and, you know, been reborn or whatever and regained his memories and, you know, who knows. But just throughout the course of human history, he's, you know, uh, curtailed events to happen in specific ways to force humanity down a specific path to prepare them for what's going to come. And then upon reaching the Age of Strife, he would step into the Four to become the supreme leader of all humanity and unite us again throughout the galaxy. Now some people take this as the most canon version of the Emperor's origin, but there are various others including the one that I actually personally subscribe to. The Shaman story is all very well and good, but it leaves me with some questions. For example, if these Shaman were some of the earliest humans with only a vague awareness of the warp, how could they have such powerful precognition to foresee the need to create such a super being? Right, I mean, that would be, like, yeah, who knows, I mean, there could be any number of things, maybe somehow, you know, they were influenced a little more, their their genes were influenced more by the old gods when they created humanity or something like that, some kind of genetic mutations, you know, that happen, you know, who knows, but I mean, yeah, it does bring up a good point how, if it's just, how, like, way back in, like, primal, you know, human days, if these, if this group, a uh, particular group of shamans or whatever, if they were that powerful, why hasn't other psychers come along up until, you know, I guess relatively recent times in the 40k history? Maybe there have, and, you know, they were just burned at the stake, you know, as, as, you know, witches or sorcerers or warlocks or, you know, whatever. How could they have such powerful precognition to foresee the need to create such a super being? In addition to that, if they were truly the earliest stowings of psychers for humanity, then surely they would not have been especially powerful. And even with their powers combined, uh, how could they summon humanity's greatest champion? No, not Captain Planet. So those two. Th <laughs> it's actually an interesting idea comparison. You know, they they Captain Planet the Emperor and. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of funny. Greatest champion. No, not Captain Planet. 
So those two things stand out for me. Also, their plan to commit mass suicide and then hope that they would all be reborn together seems pretty spurious. It seems to tick the boxes from an okay, I guess that's possible point of view, but it just doesn't make sense beyond that. Another theory is that the Emperor was in fact one of the Old Ones, who you will remember were one of the most ancient super beings who created the Eldar, the Orcs and even humanity. Yes, really, uh, go and look it up for those naysayers who think that they did not. This theory, again, at first is captivating, until you start to think about it more. And then you realise it doesn't really make any sense. The Old Ones were, as far as we are informed, uh, not shapeshifters, but creatures of light and dark. Right. There was a statement to the fact that just a single Old One escaped the brutal genocide of their race, but then was eventually killed at the birth of Slanesh when the Eldar fell. If the Emperor was some other escaped Old One, it doesn't make logical sense that they would choose one race and then ultimately lead it. Although I suppose Devil's Advocate, who's to say what would be going in the mind of this Old One after his entire race was extinguished? True, he might have seen the potential in humanity and decided to maybe transfer his soul into a human body that he created um, in order to lead humanity into the future to get revenge on the, the beings that destroyed his race, you know? Maybe, maybe that's what his whole plan was, you know, who knows? Who's to say what would be going in the mind of this old one after his entire race was extinguished? Maybe it had a crisis of conscience. Anything, I guess, is possible. And then not to mention also the fact that the Emperor would lead humanity to wage war on pretty much every other alien race, which wouldn't really serve any purpose within the context of an old one's mission True. statement. They were originally life givers. They seeded planets with life to you know, create new races in the universe. And again, unless it had simply lost the, you know, the plot and uh, was operating on his own sort of mission plan. There are some things that do fit this theory though, such as Old Ones being very powerful psychic creatures, they had extended precognition, they had very extensive, almost immortal, long life, and they would have the ability to genetically manipulate humans. But all of this seems very soft and is only plausible at best. For me, this theory just doesn't really fit. So the last theory, and the one that I personally believe, is that the Emperor was neither the creation of some bizarre suicide pact or an Old One, rather something in between. It's fair to say that in any ancient history nothing is quite as it's written and that True. some reading between the lines is necessary. History is always written by you know the ones in charge the victors so yeah history is not always actually has it's written. Any ancient and it's also you know from it's also a point of view based perspective based you know I mean like Christopher Columbus finding America is considered one of the high points in history for certain people and one of the very low points in history for other groups of people. You know, it's all about uh, perspective. Rather, something in between. It's fair to say that in any ancient history, nothing is quite as it's written and that some reading between the lines is necessary. The most ancient of history available hints that the last remaining old one floated around the galaxy meddling and dabbling and trying to have some last impact on the worlds which they felt they had failed and left their race completely annihilated. We know that the old ones were capable of creating beings of immense psychic power. This is how the ancient Eldar defeated the Necrons and Satan who were well, let's not forget gods capable of devouring stars. So the theory I stand by is that a fragmented remaining old one drifted around the galaxy until he was struck by a precognition so terrible that he had no choice but to resolve becoming involved. It could be that he saw the vision of the Eldar fall or the rise of chaos. Either way, he knew that the Eldar were by now far too arrogant to accept any help and would be of no use, remembering that the Eldar had turned their backs on the old ones long ago. The Orcs, who were also uh, an Old One's creation, they were too crass and mindless for such preparation. Instead, he would turn to the weak humans. Weak, but with great potential. And so he would decide on forming a divine creature, a humanoid of the most immense power, but birthed in such a way that he would not allow those humans would not immediately view him as a god, but as a man, to be not worshipped but instill a sense Followed. of power, of awe, yeah. of destiny. 
There are other clues as well. Apparently, further along in Earth's ancient history, a creature crashed to Earth who had an appearance we would describe as a dragon. It would seem, though, that this dragon was in fact a small fragment of the star gods, the Satan, who had been destroyed thousands of light years away by the Necrons. Even a tiny fragment of these most powerful beings would be beyond the means of even the most powerful humans to contain. The future emperor in this time wounded this creature and then apparently took it to Mars, I'm not sure how, um, but there it lay imprisoned within the planet. The final chapter of that story, Interesting. that's one for another day. Still though, this helps to secure the idea that no mere reincarnation of a few shaman could produce such or, or perform such a task. Could an old one? Perhaps. But given the other evidence, I would still discount it. But a perfectly designed humanoid of godlike form created by an old one who would know a most powerful psychic being was needed to counter not just the future darkness of man, but to face again the Satan and the Day of Reckoning when the Necrons would rise again. This seems for me the most logical and plausible of origins. I can see that, yeah. The truth though is that we cannot know the origin of the Emperor unless some definitive tome is discovered which provides secure evidence as to such, so we are left to speculate until and I don't think they're ever going to, I don't think they're ever going to want to do that. I think they're going to probably want to leave it open to, to interpretation and speculation, you know, because of, you know, people like us who want to learn and read and all that kind of stuff and, and debate it. It just makes it more interesting. Discovered, which provides secure evidence as to such. So we are left to speculate until then. One thing that is certain, though, is that the emperor was a human and holds godlike psychic power. He was within humanity throughout all of history, learning, sometimes guiding, mostly sitting in the shadows, until he was needed to take a course of action that would lead us into the Age of the Imperium. The last point worthy of mention is that the Emperor of Man would enforce a strictly secular society. In the early days of the Imperium, um, this would then enable humanity would identify with him as a man and not as a god. They wouldn't project any religious connotations onto him. Yeah, that's another thing uh, that I, I do find interesting is that at no point did he ever want to be worshipped as a god at any point. He was all about advancement and, you know, and technology and science and, and doing things that way. And so I, I find it interesting that there has been a church built around him. And I, I feel like it's probably a twofold situation where the church, where uh, the church has its purpose in keeping humanity united, uh, you know, but it's also uh, as a means for them to uh, keep power over people as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do think that that's interesting. It would also be, a, 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 I've heard rumors before in the past that they're thinking about, you know, either finally killing off the emperor and resurrecting him or just, you know, having him resurrect in general or something like that in, in the 40K universe. And so... It would be very interesting to see what would happen to the Imperium should, you know, the Emperor either get healed or be resurrected or whatever, you know, would, uh, you know, and, and, and obviously, you know, what would happen with the church? Would there be a rebellion, you know, would, would, would the church and all those people of the church who are so used to having, you know, that kind of power, would they just, you know bend the knee so to speak and just follow the emperor or would they rebel and you know claim hey it's a false emperor blah 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 the true emperor is you know what was killed by this person or this person is replaced blah you know whatever you know trying to divide for their power what would that you know cause those kind of issues and then you know would he try to redeem some of the primarchs that have been turned and have been corrupted by chaos or after what happened with Horus, will he just, you know, go and try to wipe him out? You know, it would be interesting to, to see what would happen in that case. Also, because throughout the thousands of years he spent on Earth, he would see the terrible devastation and fragmentation organized religion could cause. He believed that humanity could only achieve its full potential in a strictly secular state. However, even in the crusading period where the emperor would reunite the lost colonies of man, some people began to spread rumors that he was more than just a powerful man. These beliefs would run so strong, it would even question some Astartes to the faith. 
such as Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, one of my favourite characters in the 40k and one of the few Space Marines from the Death Guard chapter not to be corrupted by chaos. Some citizens of the Imperium consider the Emperor's stance on faith even a test so as to distinguish those who can see the whole of the truth, that he is in fact the one true God of mankind. Okay, the Age of Terror. Not Terror, Terra. We would now reach the time known as the Age of Terror. This was the period on Earth from the 1st to the 15th millennia, that is the first 15,000 years on Old Earth a period of extreme technological expansion, from a pre-industrial era to that of fusion power and travel beyond our planet and right. even solar systems. We're in that time right now, essentially. Humanity would first colonize new worlds within our system, first on Mars and then the moons of Jupiter, before mankind would start to look at how we could travel beyond. To achieve this next goal, colossal starships were created for humanity to cross the voids between solar systems and powerful engines at this time these advanced fusion drives enabled very very fast but still sublight travel. Sub light, yeah. This meant in order to reach their destination it could take anything as long as 10 generations of human yep. lifespan generational to reach their ships. Destinations. Subsequently trade and aid between human colonies was then extremely difficult and we lead to them being established almost as independent states. Very little is known of this period as imperial records are fragmented and limited. The Emperor during this time had no reason to interfere and so would continue his own work and research right. back on Earth. Study and the improvement of man all the while remaining in the shadows. So that also kind of brings up an interesting question too, like so if the Emperor really was in the background, I, I, I guess the idea with him might be that he wouldn't want to make too many advancements or bring forth too many advancements too quick, like if he is this advanced you know being that that understands science and technology so well and has lived for so long he would probably have a greater understanding of a lot of these technologies and use of the warp and travel and things like that but he probably wouldn't want to i guess bring them forth you know for humanity too soon before we're ready for them um because it could cause all kinds of issues and being that he is you know psychic he probably can see you know into the future at certain times and would probably be able to see if he did certain things in certain ways that would cause certain problems so i would assume that's probably why the emperor wouldn't just be like hey you know we just have warp technology let's let's get out there even faster and allowed you know these generational ships to go out into the into space and colonize and essentially set up their own you know independent worlds instead of just yeah, here's the warp you know we can get there in a couple of hours and keep humanity established as a whole because eventually they would run into the other alien races like the eldar and whatnot probably before they're really prepared to fight them so i guess that would make sense as to why he wouldn't bring out you know some of these technologies earlier study and the improvement of man all the while remaining in the shadows during the period between the 1st and 15th millennium, various events of discovery and importance took place <laughs> that would finally propel us to create our first interstellar confederation in the 15th millennium. One of the most important events of note would be during M4. Humanity would discover the warp and begin to research it. This is specifically relevant as it would have been one of the discoveries that would lead the Emperor to understanding the necessity of him coming into the Four. I like how, you know, people have said in certain comments or whatever when I brought up the uh, movie Event Horizon that uh, it's considered an unofficial 40k um, movie and that's actually how the warp was first discovered. Um, I, I, I like that thought. I love that movie. If you haven't seen Event Horizon, it's a great horror movie from, um, you know, the, the late 90s. Came out in 98 or 99, I think. Great horror sci-fi movie. Um, the whole premise of the movie is they're testing a new type of interstellar travel drive that uh, creates wormholes so that you can travel from point A to point B super quick, you know, um, and they lost communication with this ship and it's been gone for a few years and all of a sudden it reappears outside um, 
uh, an orbit of like Neptune or, or Uranus at the, you know, the edges of our solar system. And so a rescue ship is sent out to determine what happened. And that's essentially uh, the movie. And as you, you know, go through, I don't want to spoil too much for those who haven't seen it, but as you go through the movie, you kind of discover that it seems like it's gone through hell, which, you know, is like the warp. So I, I, I like the idea that it is an unofficial 40K movie. And I would highly recommend watching it if you haven't seen it. It's a great sci-fi horror movie. ...that would lead the Emperor to understanding the necessity of him coming into the fore. The golden or dark age of technology. This is probably where the AI uprising would not happen, right? As we reach the 15th millennium, humanity would enter a golden age of time. Like, sci-fi stuff I just always love, but it's also just the idea of exploring space and discovering new things has always interested me. Like, if, if we were, if Star Trek was real and we were in Star Trek times and the Federation was a real thing with those kind of principles, I 100% would be career Starfleet, man. Just going out and discovering you know new planets and new life and new things to and, and just exploring space uh i i 100 would want my own command and have my own starship i 100 would be a lifer in starfleet I, you know, I i wish we were in those times but obviously we're not you know hopefully we as a species will make it to that point at some point you know where we can get out there and, and truly explore um so, but I just, I, I love all, all the stuff is just, I always find stuff just so fascinating. As we reach the 15th millennium, humanity would enter a golden age of technology. This would be the highest point in mankind's technological achievements. It would last for some 10,000 years and humanity continued its rise in technology, science and power, spreading and colonizing mankind all across the Milky Way galaxy. I also do find it kind of interesting in the 40k universe that in the past is where we hit our technological like peak and that anything moving forward uh, you know is stuff that's derived from the past and it's just the uh tech priests you know talking to the machines to get them to work properly uh and they don't necessarily really understand exactly how they work um and any kind of research into new technology is considered heresy because it could be you know a corruption from from the demons of chaos and it could be a corruption of ideas and technology it, like i just find that an interesting kind of lore perspective of the past was actually like the supreme you know age of man you know because like in reality right now obviously technology has been progressing so quickly and advancing so fast i mean you know i was born in 1982 and just from you know, seeing when I was born, you know, going from basically just having, you know, color TV was still just becoming a thing back then. You know, having a color TV with like two or three channels was a big thing. And then going into to, to cable and uh, you know, cable TV and having, you know, 20 channels and then, you know, computers and the Internet and cell phones and and just how rapidly everything has progressed since then and how much more rapidly everything is progressing. It's, it's, it's an interesting idea that, you know, we still haven't in reality hit our peak of technology and it's going to be interesting to see where a lot of this technology goes and, you know, how some of it might even be integrated into our being. Um, but it's just an interesting idea that actually in the past, you know, in this universe is, is where we've actually hit the peak and it's actually kind of more of like a mythological thing. You know what I mean? The, it's not just about science. Again, it's also partly a religion with, you know, uh, the, the Adeptus Mechanicus people. It, it's a religion for them. It's not just technology. So I just find that kind of a fascinating perspective and lore. I don't know of any other universe or, or show or anything like that that has that kind of perspective on uh, science and technology. We could create our first galactic empire ruled from earth the home world and establish massive trade networks that further powered expansion and advancement this earlier period in the age of technology has a subtitle known as the stellar exodus this marks the time okay. when humanity made its first colonies on other worlds and also beyond the solar system 
These initial colonies were reached using the ships that were still only capable of sublight speeds and were restricted by this, as well as our developing but limited knowledge of building these vast scale ships. When these ships reached their destination though, they would be then slowly deconstructed and the materials right. used to build the colonies. Some would become manufactorums capable of producing massive war machines, or then back then, defensive machines. Things such as Imperial Knights and even Titans, which the colonies would use to defend themselves against the dangers of the galaxy. In a comparable way to early colonies on Earth, this meant they had to be self-sufficient and due to the large timescales involved before anyone would likely reach out to them again, they would develop their own cultures and languages largely mm -hmm. influenced by the noble families established on these interstellar voyages, as well as physical elements on the new homeworld. The planet's characteristics would also shape the way in which their societies would evolve. Now, some 6,000 years later, around the period of Millennium 21, mankind now began a process of militarization. It is not known who or for what reason created this process or started it off, but along with our expansion and colonization of planets, we also began to expand and develop our weapons and forces. Fragments of what was developed during this age of technology, such as Imperial Knights, Titans, Land Raider designs, and so on, the would later the be recovered so cool by looking, the Imperium. Man far into the future the largest proportion however and i mean just just think of the idea of how big those shells are that that are in the the, the dual chain guns he's got there man like like those are probably like car or truck sized you know bullets shells cannon you know whatever you want to call them going in there in in into these you know giant chain guns it's just, i don't know the shit's so cool need to be recovered by the imperium far into the future the largest proportion however would be lost to the tides of time and we can only imagine or hope to continue recovering these lost and most powerful of technologies in the 41st millennium humanity had risen to a period of immense power through our technology and whilst the emperor of man existed he had not made himself known to mankind he continued to bide his time lying in the shadows studying planning observing the very fact that the Emperor is one of the few who would live through this time and on into the Age of the Imperium, and this would then have far-reaching implications for humanity, as the Emperor would carry his knowledge and strength of this Golden Age into a time when none would recall it. And where I was going to say, that I, that is kind of an interesting thought, is that, you know, the Emperor is alive during this time, so, I mean, I, I guess, you know, in the present of the 40k universe, the Emperor isn't in a state where he can really, like, talk to people but you know it's interesting like has the history really been lost or is it just like redacted because the church doesn't want people to know or look into certain things you know what i mean because if the emperor was alive i'm sure he would bring a lot of this technology a, a lot of the history with him and i would i would assume that there would be people around him that would want to record this and he would want it recorded because he would want uh, again He's he's into science and progression and not religion and, you know, worship. So I would think he would want people around him to record history so that humanity could learn from it and and know where they came from so that they can move forward. So it's interesting. It's just an interesting thought that, yeah, a lot, how much of history is either forgotten or has been, you know, redacted because the church may not want people to know where it would be of critical importance to our survival for the emperor he would use this knowledge of the age of technology to bring humanity back to a glimmer of what once had been in the thousands Dude, a lot of, years, of this artwork is so beautiful too first interstellar empire we would become as much as the eldar supremely dependent on technology humankind had risen to a level of godlike understanding and this was embraced and practiced by the people of the time the Empire of Mankind was seen as a bastion of technological achievement and began to use a new class of humans entitled the Navigators to expand our reach and use the newly discovered warp to travel beyond the distances of existing star drives and cover vast distances in a short time. A Navigator's role is to, as the name suggests, protect and guide a ship through the tides and dangers of the warp. Eventually, over time, humanity would find the warp had become too turbulent to traverse. 
but in this time navigators uh, they're not strictly right. psychers as such they possess a special gene called unsurprisingly the navigator gene they also possess other abnormal characteristics including a third eye in the forward head hmm. uh, as well as some more alien appearances such as no pupils in their human eyes and translucent skin as well as maybe larger than normal appendages their origin is believed to have not been a natural development but to have come about through genetic experimentation and engineering in this period of the age of technology i mean yeah that would make sense if you gotta have it, it would just make sense that yeah the, the if they if they go through specific genes if they have to have specific genes in order to traverse the warp it would make sense that there's genetic manipulation involved and that it would obviously change their appearance having a third eye larger appendages you know all that kind of stuff it would make sense then yeah it's not a natural mutation in that it was probably played around with by the emperor it was likely that mankind discovered the warp and that it could be utilized for crossings but that required a safe means to traverse it and looked to create a solution to that problem mankind's age of expansion and technological glory across the galaxy would lead to many worlds requiring their own localized defense forces in this time humanity's mastery of technology was largely unequaled and this would be employed in the defense and relative growth of the colonies one of these defense forces, uh, one of the most powerful of them, would be the Imperial Knights. These were colossal war machines that towered over all they surveyed on a battlefield. They were built with the knowledge of the Golden Age of Technology, and these giants survived until the Imperial Age. But they can essentially no longer be constructed from scratch. And as is often the case with technology in the Imperium, it is now merely maintained. The Imperial it's interesting and, and i guess you know that could also probably go into i guess the, the the religious doctrine that's going on in the present time but it's it's an interesting to me that they aren't able to reverse engineer a lot of these technologies and rebuild it from scratch and i guess a safe way you know what i mean um i'm surprised that there hasn't been any kind of tech priest or whoever who has been authorized to try to do that maybe they have maybe they have gone through and tried to do that and had certain experiments and things went wrong and um you know tapped into the warp in certain ways that caused certain problems or or whatever um and i know there was at some point in time a huge ai uprising that was a big problem and that's also one of the big reasons why technology is very uh kept under a locking key, you know, so that things like that don't happen again. And instead of using technology, they're implanted with like humans who've been like lobotomized, almost kind of like how it is in Star Wars. There's certain humans that have that like computer band thing on the back of their head that acts as like another like part of the brain that helps them compute things or whatever better, but they're not quite human anymore um it's almost kind of like that where they have but like obviously in the 40k universe taken to the extreme you know cranked up to 21 um but anyway so yeah it's often the case with technology in the imperium it is now merely maintained the imperial knights themselves were operated by nobles from the colony worlds who would be entombed within them they are sworn to protect their citizens from all xenos threats and the endless nightmares in the universe as the knights would advance into the later ages, they continued their noble values and morals. Some of the knights are the most selfless and dedicated forces within the Imperium, as well as being some of the oldest. As with most technology from the Dark or Golden Age technology, the knights are immensely powerful, allowing them to run and I fight bet, yeah. as much as a dreadnought would fight, but on a much larger scale. These ancient heroes have fought thousands of battles across millennia and stand ready to defend Imperial citizens and support Astartes anywhere in the galaxy. After the Knights we have the Titans and Titans are the epic war machines of the Imperial. Yeah, they're the massive, a knight massive and ones. The smallest Titan can be anything like 9, 10 meters, but the big Titans can be anything up to 50 meters. They are like kaiju size death machines. 
Many people believe that the Mechanicum were originally responsible for creating the Titans. This is not strictly correct. They do construct some Titans, but many they simply maintain. This is because the technology used to create Titans is very, very old. And like many things in the universe of Warhammer 40,000 for the Imperium, a lot of technology is merely maintained because of its complexity. Uh, simpler devices are constructed, but this happens less and less. But the Mechanicum do create some titans for the Imperium. Okay. Originally, the Mechanicus found versions that were completely autonomous, created in the Golden Age of Technology. And the largest titan so far discovered was upon the lost forge world of Charania. It was a completely autonomous war machine and was dubbed the Castigator class titan. Its schematic was apparently also contained within a standard template construct on this planet and it was far superior to any class of titan utilized by the Adeptus Mechanicus or any other intelligent race in the galaxy. This was so far the only known discovered Castigator class titan but it was subsequently destroyed by Imperial Grey Knights. Grey Knights are the secretive and unbreakable order mm. of Astartes warriors dedicated to the protection of the Imperium from the very darkest foes that humanity faces in the 41st millennium. Now the portion of the STC database- I wonder why they destroyed it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know the Grey Knights are like extreme in their purging of anything chaos, you know, related. So I, I guess if it was fully autonomous, maybe they thought the AI somehow was corrupted or something like that, but yeah, I wonder why, if it's the most powerful and advanced Titan they've ever seen, you know, why would they destroy it? ...that humanity faces in the 41st millennium. Now, the portion of the STC database containing the data for the manufacture of the Castigator-class Titan was also destroyed by the Mechanicus. It possessed AI, which is strictly outlawed and heretical within the Imperium. Secondly, it had somehow long ago been corrupted by living chaos energy, and for this reason, it could go. obviously no longer be That's supported. the reason. Imperial records of this event, though, note that the cost of life and resources required to destroy this Titan monstrosity was severe. The key point here, though, is that mankind was developing machines in the Golden Age of Technology that would never again be equaled. They could be merely right, copied, far advanced emulated, or used as a template is. to work from in the future. But our level of knowledge, our rules and guides on what could be created, due in part to events that were yet to come, would very much limit humanity's advancement in the millennia that lay ahead. I mentioned a moment ago something called an STC. This denotes a device known as a standard template construct. These are one of the single most valuable objects in the galaxy for the Imperium, and their importance was no less during the Age of Technology. So what is an STC? STC systems were advanced AI computers created during the Golden or Dark Age of Technology, and are said to have contained the sum total of human, scientific, and technological knowledge. Really? STCs were okay. created when Those human be... interstellar civilization I could see why those things would be so highly sought after then. If it's supposed to be like the, the so total sum knowledge of certain technologies of humanity, like, yeah, that's like, that'd be like finding the Holy Grail. ...knowledge. STCs were created when human interstellar civilization was at its technological peak. Their original purpose was to enable colonists to survive on the new worlds they arrived upon, as they could not carry securely the mass amount of knowledge gained by humanity at this time, and even if they could, they might not have people capable of understanding how to utilize this. The STC solved this problem, it enabled the colonies to access all of humanity's knowledge and display it in a way for them to be able to create anything they needed from the resources that would be huge and solve any issue that could arise for them on the new home worlds no matter the wow. geography resource limitations or climate this would enable them to build anything from a simple las gun to a fortified bunker massive war machines or an atmospheric processor stc systems possessed the ability to not just store information but also to produce new designs to meet changing circumstances they are immensely powerful sources of information and power and consequently so i guess the question that i would have then if these things are so advanced that way 
I mean, I guess it would depend on the technology information that's in these SDCs or whatever. But if it's able to take technology then and adapt it to the needs of whatever is going on and whatever circumstance that's happening, you know, now, why wouldn't, you know, humanity in the current time be able to construct stuff um, you know, as powerful, as good during the golden age, just modified for what they need now. You know what I mean? Um, unless again, it just goes against, you know, it's heresy, you know, it goes against uh, the religious doctrine of, um, you know, what is there right now? Because I mean, I guess a lot of stuff might, like they said, like you said, you know, some of the stuff is probably AI based and potentially corrupted by chaos in certain ways. So I guess, you know, some of it might not just, just might not be able to be used. But I, I guess that would be a question that, yeah, that I would have is if, it, if it's so advanced that it's able to modify what the technology information is stored in there, if it's able to modify it for current time, the current needs you know, then why why couldn't they just create, you know, stuff from the golden age as good, you know, from and maybe they can. Maybe they maybe they you know, some of these things they are able to use and are able to create, you know, things on the scale and as good and as powerful as it was during the peak of technology modified for what the current needs are. And maybe that is why they're so highly sought after. Um yeah. Are immensely powerful sources of information and power and consequently the Imperium places a high value on obtaining these lost I mean, I would say so. of ancient knowledge. Even though now after many thousands of years have passed most of the discovered STCs are damaged to the point they only contain fragments of their former stored information but Imperial forces will still use any means or resources necessary to obtain an STC once it has been discovered, even if this means the sacrifice of legions of military or civilian Imperial citizens. From the golden age of technology and into the ages to come, these valuable systems will be lost or destroyed, so that now in the age of the Imperium, they have become beyond rare, almost just a legend. So the consequent discovery of remnants of any new technology from the dark age of technology puts an STC's value to humanity beyond estimation. The like a holy relic, yeah, like I said, the holy grail. Damaged STC units is then utilized, copied, and stored by the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus, who are based deep on the primary forge homeworld of Mars. They believe that STCs are the most holy of artifacts and will seek and protect them at any cost. This little divergence is an important one because an STC recovery, no matter its state of repair, still remains as one of the most important objectives for Imperial forces in the 41st millennium. The holy grail of this quest though, although unlikely, would be to recover an intact STC, thereby right. gifting the Imperium all of the stored knowledge of mankind from the golden age of technology. If the Imperium were able to recover an STC of this standard, it would catapult the existing human society into becoming yet again one of the most advanced and significantly, if not the most powerful state in the galaxy. The STC Crusade also explains in part about the state of technology and development of the Imperium in that much of the knowledge regarding tech is replicated or learned rather than invented and created. Although new tech does come along, it's not overtly specified why so little resources are put into research now. It could be speculated though, however, that mankind relied so strongly upon the Emperor in the last 10 millennia that now they believe he only he is capable of directing mankind's advancement. I can and see that. solely focus on maintaining him and maintaining the state. I can see that also being turned affairs. into religious doctrine that way too. So we return to our story, and at this time, in the golden age of technology, humanity continues to expand across the galaxy. Initially slowly, as the gigantic starships we crafted were incapable of using the warp to traverse space. And as we learned previous, they took generations to reach their destination. They were essentially travelling worlds, similar to the Eldar craft world of the 41st millennium. 
When these ships reached their destination, they would slowly be deconstructed and their materials could be used to create massive war machines such as the Imperial Knights and Titans, which the colony could use to defend themselves against the dangers of the galaxy. Dangers such as the Eldar and Orcs who were first discovered in this period as a result of our reaching out beyond our own system to more regularly explore the galaxy. However, interestingly, during this time, humanity was actually considered more powerful than it is in the 41st millennium. Really? The strength was mainly due to our technology rather than actual physical forces, such as Astartes, who did not exist in this age. Science was humanity's primary religion, and the society of man perceived itself as having reached a time where no one could be a real challenge to us. So our technology was even so was more advanced than the Eldar because the Eldar have been around for like millions of years, right? And their technology is super advanced. So if our technology is considered more powerful and, and able to keep up, if not overtake theirs, like, damn, damn, we caught up quick, brother. <laughs> Perceived itself as having reached a time where no one could be a real challenge to us. To a degree, this was actually true, so much so that the Xenos races of Eldar and Orc actually signed non aggression pacts with mankind. Really? Which... Even the Orcs signed not aggression? The Orcs, brother? The, the dudes that just want to go out and fight and kill shit sign non aggression pacts with humanity because we were that fucking badass? What? What? And the Eldar, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure the Eldar see us as, like, basically just like monkeys. They see us as, like, vastly less than. So, like, okay, okay, all right, we were that bad. At, damn, damn, damn. Races of Eldar and Orc actually signed non-aggression pacts with mankind, which seems bizarre from the Orc point of view, but there we are. The discovery and use of interstellar drives, that is, an engine enabling cross-warp travel. And also, I, I know the, Tyr the Tyranids and the Necrons weren't, well, I mean, the Necrons were asleep, but the Tyranids hadn't started invading the galaxy at that point yet, so, like, that would also be a question, is if the Necrons were around at that, or not the Necrons, the Tyranids, if the Tyranids were around at that point in time, would we have been better off dealing with them? Would we have been able to deal with them better? And... Because we signed non-aggression packs with the orcs and the Eldar, would we have been able to potentially, uh, you know, created alliances with those races and fought the Tyranids at, at, on, on a united front? That would change things drastically. You know, having a common enemy like the Tyranids come in, uh, you know, and forcing the, the races to unite against them, that would, that would you know think about how that would change the history of the 40k universe that would be an interesting like what if series to go down like a little what if like uh you know book series you know if if that happened you know what what could have been that would be something i would be interested in in you know reading or, or looking at or whatever now powered humanity's expansion and domination of the galaxy forward a federated government was formed, enabling us to create a strong trade community. We created the Federation. Remain okay. unified and powerful throughout our colonies. The 40k Star Trek. Aiding and supporting where necessary with either materials, logistics, or military. The exact form and nature of this federation is unknown from this time, as so much knowledge and history was lost. To speculate, though, it seems likely that from the way in which humans would live at this time, the Federation would have focused more on discovery, science, and working to... Literally, literally, the Star Trek, but like Star Trek in what, like the 20th, 30th, 30th millennium or something like that? Because this is, I think this is even before the, the Emperor revealed himself, which wasn't until like the beginning of the 30th, you know, millennium, something like that. I don't know. But like, damn. Time, the Federation would have focused more on discovery, science, and working to better humanity, as well as supporting our widespread colonies. As the societies we had seeded across the galaxy grew stronger and more developed, most humans would live long, peaceful lives where menial actions were carried out by automation, leaving people time to indulge in their own lives and dedicate themselves to the glorious expansion of mankind. 
this golden age of peace bears a stark contrast to the unforgiving brutality of the 41st millennium yeah. the imperium where many citizens are now born into lives pendulum swings both ways driven and even hellish good times lead to bad times bad times lead back to good back times and timeline, though, everything and in between navigators have now been discovered and enabled interstellar travel psychers that is humans with strong psychic ability had for the longest time evaded or simply passed undetected it would be in the age of technology where this new class of human would finally be identified these psychers seemingly largely avoided the demonic possessions which had occurred for the old ones orc and elder it is unclear why this would be but again you may speculate that the emperor had a role to play in guiding and shielding humanity through this time as we know he had always lain in the shadows ensuring our safety and creating small influence until he felt it was necessary to come to the fore another so i wonder if then he like i wonder if the emperor was so powerful that he knew you know every psyker or whatever and maybe like influenced and protected them because he knew they were going to be a big um they were going to be needed in the future you know, for the help and defense of humanity. So I wonder if he protected and even kind of encouraged, you know, possibly inner, you know, breeding of different psychers to create more powerful ones or something like that, you know, when he was still in the shadows. The possibility is that by comparison, the Orcs and Eldar with their more advanced psychic powers simply shone brighter. As we know, the demons of the warp are actually- That makes sense too. If they were more powerful psychers, the uh, demons of the warp would probably be more attracted, more interested in them than humanity at that time. That could make sense too. Powers simply shone brighter. As we know, the demons of the warp are actually attracted to psychic power in real space, like moths to a lamp. And so they appeared amid the depths of the galaxy, a brighter beacon for the chaotic creatures to be attracted towards. Whereas the human psychers were very early in development, their powers were less attractive. They did not stand out so much. These psychic mutations were initially limited to only a few individuals per billion or so humans, but toward the end of the Age of Technology, psychers would appear throughout the colonies more widespread than ever before. And some colonies who were advanced and open-minded, they could see the potential advantages brought by human psychers, and they were protected and allowed to develop and explore their abilities. However, on other, less advanced human colonies, they are often killed and hunted down as the people here feared rather than embraced right. their divergent powers. Seen as witches, warlocks, etc. Witch hunt. As I hinted at earlier, one of the reasons during the golden age of technology that humanity was able to not only survive, but stretch itself out to colonize and conquer worlds in the galaxy, not to mention defending itself against aggressive Xenos, would be due to their reliance on AI and the machine creations of the time. However, as nearly all science fiction dictates, these primary sentient machines in the Human Galactic Federation would be known as the Men of Iron, and they would stereotypically turn on their creators and enter us into a cataclysmic war. An STC containing a template for the Men of Iron was discovered by Imperial forces on a chaos-controlled world. It became apparent that much as the Castigator class Titan, the Men of Iron here had also been corrupted. That brings up an interesting point. Point: Would any of the Chaos Legions, you know, uh, if they were to find some of these STCs, you know, how interested in in creating, you know, an AI network in these Iron Men would they be? Because that could be a, a, a very huge tactical advantage that they could have. If they could, you know, create these AI, corrupt them with the chaos, get the AI to do what they wanted, and then you've got just legions of technological, you know, beings that could be created on a whim that you could spread out and, and do whatever you want. So... That kind of, yeah, that just how, how interested would would any of the Chaos Legions be in, you know, finding these and using them to create, you know, the various technologies. The Castigator class Titan, the Men of Iron here, had also been corrupted by Chaos, and the AI of these creations was sentient. So we can perhaps speculate that the Men of Iron initially resented their human creators, but combined with this, were also corrupted 
possibly by chaos, which at the time was relatively unknown to mankind, hence the lack of any documentation to support such speculation. It is, however, a possibility and stacks up with what we know of the corruptibility of human AI creations. Also, the intent of the dark forces of chaos to obliterate humanity once it became aware of its existence. Right. Regardless of the reason, though, this war was one of the greatest disasters to befall humanity and would rage for centuries. The exact length of the war is not recorded. The conflict was eventually won by humanity, but at a great cost. The damage caused by this conflict to interstellar human society was hugely destructive. We would lose masses of knowledge and technology, not to mention devastating humanity's economic strength and political unity. Right. All planets, I'm sure, were lost. A series of events that would lead into the collapse of the Federation of Humanity at the end of the Age of Technology. As so often is the case, very little information exists from this time, largely due to the Imperium being so wary of a similar disaster happening again. And this is why, amongst the Imperium of Mankind, you'll find only the simplest forms of AI. It is viewed as being exceptionally dangerous technology and is strictly outlawed. A substitute is often to combine human and machine into mindless drone-like beings known as servitors. Servitors are the Imperium's cybernetic servants, lacking true self-awareness and are created from the bodies of either condemned criminals who are unpleasantly lobotomized or vat-grown humanoids whose bodies and brains are partially replaced with machine systems. As a result of this catastrophic conflict between the men of iron and humanity in the golden age of technology, it is now considered one of the most severe crimes in Imperial society to develop a self-aware artificially intelligent machine it is just considered too dangerous to even consider i'm sure there's probably stories in like in books or whatever where that has happened i i would assume there's probably some uh stories of inquisitors who are tracked down people who've created things like that so if there is let me know stuff like that would be interesting i'd be interested in getting into stories and reading stuff like that around millennium 23 the warp was taking hold of psychers and wreaking havoc on human colonies. Feudal night worlds were more conservative and less abiding of psychers, as we said previously, who had hunted them down. These would fare better than the others who had adopted them more open mindedly at the time. The knights in their semi titan armor would battle massive warp entities and serve to protect the planet's human population, abiding to their strict code of feudal discipline and ability. Very often, they would be the bastions that protected mankind's worlds, and their importance cannot be underestimated at this time. As is often the case in history, it is not one, but a series of disasters that leads to total domination. Yeah. And this was no exception for the glorious empire humanity had established during the Dark Age of Technology. So it's interesting to me too, uh, I, I guess a question would be to ask, um, and I don't know if there is an answer to this or not, but why, I, I, again, it could just be because the Emperor has the precognitive abilities and he just saw that it wasn't the right time. But during this peak time of technology, why would the Emperor come forth and make himself known and help progress technology even further? Maybe, maybe he did and I I'm miss, you know, Maybe I missed something. Maybe maybe he did say that the emperor because I thought the emperor doesn't come forward until, uh, like towards the beginning of the age of strife. Um. But yeah, so I, I guess that's a question that I would have: is why hasn't the emperor already stepped forward and made himself known and help advance things even further? Because I would think at at this point where humanity was at their peak, he would want to step forward and help progress humanity even further, and he probably could have even potentially stopped the AI from being corrupted and humanity from falling and regressing downwards. You know what I mean? So like if human civilization was at a point where technology was so advanced that even the other alien races want nothing to do with us, they don't want to fight us. They don't want to fuck with us. They don't want, they don't want anything to do with us. You know, why wouldn't he step forward then and, and, and help lead humanity into an even better future and prevent some of these things? Um, 
you know, that would be, I guess, a question that I would have if anyone has answers to those. Whilst it was struggling to recover from a collapse in its unity, as well as destruction of many of its resources and its ability to trade efficiently with other worlds, a new disaster would occur that would see the end of humanity's golden age and instead throw us further into near total annihilation. The race of man would never again reach this golden pinnacle of technological achievement. Stuff like it to me is sad too. The age of strife. As we learned in ancient Eldar lore, it was at this time that the Eldar out in the galaxy would fall into near total destruction. These would be dark days indeed, as the Eldar were almost wiped out in a cataclysmic annihilation as the Chaos God Slanesh was born into existence from the horrifically depraved mire the Eldar society had fallen into. This was a disaster for the Eldar, nearly extinguishing their light from the universe. 90% of them were killed instantly. But it didn't do humanity instantly. any favours either. The near destruction of the Eldar and birth of Slanesh only came to mark the end of the Age of Strife. What caused it prior to these events was the ever-expanding sea of psychic energy known as the Warp. Yeah. For many millennia, this had been growing more and more powerful, fueled by the nightmarish depravity that was Eldar society. Around the end of Millennium 24 and the beginning of 25, mankind was still struggling. And I guess that would also be another question. And maybe he didn't see this, but if the Emperor saw how what the Eldar were doing was going to corrupt the warp and make the Chaos Demons even more powerful and mess up warp travel and things like that so much, why wouldn't he take a more active stance and go fight the Eldar, you know? Um, try to wipe, not necessarily maybe wipe them out, but I guess bring their influence down to the point where it isn't affecting the warp so much or um make alliances with like the craft world eldars that were against all this you know debauchery stuff you know uh you know going after and maybe fighting the drakari and keeping their influence down so that their influence on the warp wasn't so great um and again, it, it could just be where maybe he wasn't able to see that kind of stuff or maybe he saw some kind of series of events happening that would take history you know, of humanity down a different, darker path that would cause even more problems. You know, I, I don't know. I, again, if anyone has an answer to that question, if there is an answer to that question, you know, let me know. Around the end of Millennium 24 and the beginning of 25, mankind was still struggling to recover from the disastrous war against its Men of Iron and its far-reaching impact on the previously secure and strong Human Federation. With their galactic unity destroyed, as well as suffering from the inevitable wounds of war, material shortages, mass loss of life and destruction of infrastructure, we would now face a new problem. Warp travel was becoming increasingly difficult. The warp's instability, caused in part by the Eldar's depraved psychic society, meant that many ships now would become lost and consumed by the warp as they were traveling through. This was not an issue for the Eldar themselves, as they used their webways to travel, which you know were outside of what that warp space. Right. For humanity, though, it would be a severe problem, and its impact would deal the fatal blow to an already fragile empire. The losses and damage caused by the war with the Men of Iron, combined with now being unable to travel across the warp to cross those great distances in the galaxy, would ultimately return humanity to a pre-Dark Age of Technology state, where wow. only sublight travel was possible. This was a disaster. Trade and support could no longer be conducted, as these journeys would now take generations to complete. Humanity was once again isolated as it had been millennia before. The warp storms and the isolation they would create would last for over 5,000 years and their effect on human society across the galaxy was catastrophic. 
Some planets with a significantly advanced human colony would survive into the future if they had the means to defend and support themselves. It's important to understand that when a system is set up with no established backup, its collapse has an immediate and profound impact. Yeah. This was the case with mankind's trade system. It had grown over time to enable many planets to survive solely on imports from other rich Yeah, a lot of planets had like a specific sole purpose of being like a mining planet or, or you know, whatever, uh, a farming planet or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all it was. That's all they had to deal with. And so they relied on the uh trade from other colonies and other places and that's like cut off just instantly you know I, it, it would almost be like you know right now if a massive solar storm were to hit you know us and our satellites and gps and a lot of those technologies were to get shut down or even the power grid were to be affected because that can happen too like we'd be brought back to the stone age and be turned into hunter gatherers kind of overnight you know, we would have to start relying on so, because, I mean, just think about that. That that would be, like, yeah, devastating. A ...time to enable many planets to survive solely on imports from other rich parts of the Human Federation. Without this infrastructure and no way to gain outside support, disaster was inevitable. Many would turn inwardly to the colony, consuming themselves from the inside out. First, Definitely. the barbaric civil war, and later, total anarchy, fighting over the scarce resources that remained. The final phase often led the significantly depleted population into a feudal system of warlords and barbarism. Mm -hmm. This chaos was repeated across the majority of human worlds in this period, even including Earth. At this time on Earth, large areas across the planet had become massive cities reaching for hundreds of miles and having become adapted to a system where all activities were conducted by machines, Earth also now relied heavily on trade from colonized worlds to support the extremely high population count. Additionally, Man. much of the planet was no longer capable of food production and yep. hadn't been for millennia, hence the need for colonies and expansion in the first place. With the inability to travel and trade, Earth descended into a similar fate of the less advanced worlds. First panic and general disorder, then food riots, resource hoarding, and finally complete anarchy. A tribal warlord system was all that remained of the few survivors left on Earth, brutal warriors who battled out across the deserts and hives of the remnants of civilization. Turn into Mad Max. This whole situation might sound unbelievable that society could collapse so quickly and to such a severe degree, but it's worth considering that in this time, human society had built itself up to be so strong in belief of its own invincibility that they simply yeah, they, did not and could not have yeah. anticipated the severity of they the just see it or it. how. Too many significant events happen in too quick of a time that they just weren't prepared for. And I mean, like. You look at COVID, look what happened with the pandemic, man. Like society for, you know, at least a couple months, you know, around here, pretty much collapsed, you know, like no one was able to go to work. Everyone was on lockdowns. People were wondering how they were going to make money and how they were going to get food and how long things were going to last for, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it was a very uh, kind of minor scale version of some of this stuff here that they're talking about because i mean if it had been even more serious who knows where we would be right now and and what would be going on in the world not and could not have anticipated the severity of the warp storms or how they would debilitate the trade and support systems that they had been relying upon human history is littered with examples of sheer arrogance outweighing logic yep. and reason as well as blindly staring down dangerous facts in favor of belief in our own self-importance. The lack of planning when it comes to losing their infrastructure across human systems was an acute example of human arrogance. It would now seem as well that whatever had protected human psychers from demonic possession would now end. It's my speculation that as previously stated, the Emperor was what provided this shielding, even though he was not known to humanity at this time for he knew the power importance and value of human psychers in the dark times that would lie ahead without this bubble of protection that had invisibly existed prior to this time humanity's weak psychers would be consumed possessed 
and go completely insane, causing chaos among isolated, colonized worlds. This period of complete anarchy would last for some 5,000 years, and during this time, many colonies would forget their Damn. family out in the galaxy, as well as losing vast amounts of technology and knowledge. I mean, God, just imagine that. that that's almost kind of like a long story of what happened at the end of, of Mass Effect, um, you know, at 3 with everything being cut off. But, I mean, just, just think about that. Going from, like, the peak of not only like your civilization, but the peak of what ex seemingly exists in the galaxy or universe. Like you're at a point where these other alien races who've been al around for millions of years don't want anything to do with you because you're that fucking technologically advanced and can take them on and wipe them out. And like, man, going from that to like almost probably seemingly overnight back down to uh, a hunter gatherer or like survival situation that's rough man out in the galaxy as well as losing vast amounts of technology and knowledge only fragments of the glory of humanity would remain preserved on the advanced worlds who were capable to survive this dark time by the 28th millennium, almost all traces of civilization on Earth were gone. Instead, techno-barbarians battled one another over the scraps of the ancient human race. Mars, however, was Very one of the few worlds to undergo a different process. After a brief period of anarchy, the tech priests of the cult Mechanicus emerged victorious over the Psyker mutants and then unified their homeworld. The priests visited Earth, but upon seeing its barren destruction, wrote it off as unsalvageable. They wow. used any titans they had to help them in the future reunification of man. They would also be one of the few worlds to reach out and recolonize planets in this time. Using their knowledge of the warp, they chose moments of calm amid the storms of the time in the warp to travel through and establish new forge worlds. These were replicas wow. of the tech homeworld of Mars and enabled them to continue support and recovery of the technology of man, as well as production of munitions and simpler war machines. But for humanity, its golden age was over. This dark age of technology had fallen apart catastrophically. Many of the weapons that once served mankind brought us to near destruction and turned lush garden worlds into irradiated deserts mechanical factory worlds into dystopian nightmares, beautifully advanced and artistic colonies turned into barbaric, nightmarish hells devoid of all morality. The age of strife was upon mankind, and only the further darkness of the future lay ahead. Roughly 5,000 years later, around the period of millennium 30 to 31, human society had reached a state of pitiful decay after cannibalizing itself for millennia. The Eldar had also reached the peak of their social decay, and so heralded the agonizing birth of the Chaos God Slanesh, who would consume the majority of their population in one cataclysmic event that brought Eldar society to the brink of extinction. This horrific event, though, would have a positive outcome for mankind. It consumed really? all of that stored, turbulent warp energy. So after thousands of years of instability, the warp returned to relative oh. calm. Interstellar communication and travel would once again be possible. I mean, I guess that would make sense. If, you know, 90% of the Eldar race, so untold, like, trillions of, of people being that were affecting the warp in a negative way, killed instantly and their souls, you know, devoured. I guess that would tend to calm things down a little bit, you know? Returned to relative calm. Interstellar communication and travel would once again be possible for the civilization of mankind. Okay, so now we're getting into the Emperor himself here. So the Age of Strife was coming to an end. But before we move forward, we need to move back some 2,000 years to M28 to M30. Humanity had now come close to the brink of destruction itself. So many worlds had fallen into disarray, starvation, chaos, anarchy. Now was the time. This would be the time 
where the mysterious and powerful Psyker who had wandered amongst humanity for thousands of years would come to the fore to lead humanity from an edge of unsalvageable darkness back into the light and resume their place as a meaningful power in the galaxy. Earth had by now been reduced to a chemically irradiated barren wasteland. Its population was slaughtered and all that remained were degenerate feral nomads fighting for irrelevant territories. Insane wandering prophets and cyber augmented techno barbarians who lived for nothing other than to fight, created in the cradle of world ending war. Frail empires would rise and disintegrate as quickly and forgettably as they had risen. No tribe or faction had enough power or resources to make any meaningful stand, and so it went on. Pathetic. F yeah, I think it would just it would be incredibly difficult. Like if Earth is mostly just an irradiated wasteland, you know, not being able to have food to supply troops and water to supply troops, and being able to just have a population able to sustain its own numbers, it would be hard to just create a force that could do anything. Let alone trying to unify, you know, people. So, I mean, yeah. Had enough power or resources to make any meaningful stand. And so it went on. Pathetic fighting over the remnants of a ravaged world. Out of this seemingly endless horror came a single man. A warlord like no other. His title in these early days is unknown. But we would know who he would rise to become the Emperor of Man. He would first conquer and then rebuild humanity, leading it into the light, saving it from itself to form his autocracy. Are there stories of the early days of him doing this? That would be a, a period of time in history that I would be interested in, in reading and learning about. I think it would be a pretty epic kind of Game of Thrones type of, of show to do. Would be following, you know, the Emperor of Man during this time period and him you know unifying earth and, and and then going beyond you know unifying the fighting and unifying the warlords of earth and then going beyond earth and and unifying uh a lot of the colonies and, and stuff i think that would be a pretty dope show done in kind of a game of thrones style from obviously his kind of perspective is the main character's perspective but some of the other warlords going along and then eventually you could get to the point where you know the show is done from his perspective but also getting into um the perspective of some of the primarchs and stuff like that as he makes them i think that'd be sick that'd be sick uh if anyone's out there that, that hears this uh you know just send me the check for the idea we're we're good you know you know what i'm saying leading it into the light saving it from itself to form his autocracy known as the Imperium of Mankind. Unlike so many before him though, he had power not only as an unstoppable warrior, but in many other traits such as rational thinking, tactics, philosophy, economics, compassion, foresight, and perhaps most importantly, a genius of science, everything and more that would be required for a supreme leader. The Emperor though, fought not for selfish personal gain or bloodlust of war mm -hmm. like all the other scattered remnants of humanity left on Earth. He had selfless, higher goals to restore humanity spiritually, intellectually and physically to revert us to a time of strength and prosperity. These were the years of the Unification Wars. The Emperor had long held a facility deep in a range of mountains previously known as the Himalayas. This was his most significant stronghold and would later become the Imperial Palace. Here he experimented with genetics as well as developing and constructing weapons and armor for his warriors. In the earliest days, he would physically and genetically augment some of the most powerful barbarians. These humanoids would become known as the Thunder Warriors. The very first of their kind and the most basic template for what would eventually become the Imperial Space Marines, the Astartes the greatest warriors in the galaxy. Under unsurmountable pressure from the Emperor's army of Thunder Warriors, the barbaric factions fell quickly and humanity was united on bet, all yeah. Earth for the first time in centuries. Again, you know, living in that kind of time, it would probably be very difficult to really unify any kind of force. So someone with his power and cunning and, and, and ability, uh, and then genetically modifying, um, you know, the people that he's conquering to be even better and more loyal to him. 
going out there and and trying to fight against that would probably be near impossible at that time with what resources you would have fell quickly and humanity was united on old earth for the first time in centuries this however would come at a terrible cost for the thunder warriors themselves and is one of the least known yet darkest events for mankind in order to unify Earth and bring humanity back on the path of advancement and strength, the Emperor had found it necessary to, in part, cleanse the savagery that had grown on the war-torn planet. This sadly meant the death of many arguable innocents during the Unification Wars, as well as the eradication of the last remaining religious church on Earth, known as the Church of the Lightning Stone. The Emperor is known to have personally spoken to the last remaining priest before bringing in his new age of enforced secular rationalism and the ideology known as the Imperial Truth. This essentially tells that humanity are now those destined to be the rulers of the galaxy. The Eldar had their chance and failed, and now humanity are the best set to take their place as the dominant force. This ideology I feel like that kind of ideology would only kind of reinforce the theory of the Emperor being a fragment of an old one or uh, something like that. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like that kind of... You know, because the old ones created the Eldar and the Orcs and, you know, the Eldar kind of fell off into their own dark path and, and didn't really, I guess, elevate themselves up. Like, once the Eldar hit you know, I guess what they would consider their peak of civilization, um, they regress back in a century overload way instead of kind of continuing on, I guess, maybe a more spiritual uh, enlightening, uh, you know, I guess for a lack of a better term or, um, you know, uh, but essentially they, they regressed instead of progressing through different means and ways. Um, although I guess, you know, maybe from their perspective and point of view, because they're emotionally and sensorily, uh, more heightened than we are, um, maybe they saw that as a, uh, progression or enlightenment, but it just took a turn to the dark side. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of feel like the ideology of the Eldar had their chance and failed and humanity... Uh, is the last creation mm, to, you know, go out and truly rule the universe and make the universe a better place um, through science and technology and progression um, and him being a being powerful enough to do that. I would think that would give more credit to the theory of him being a fragment or indeed, you know, maybe an old one. Um, you know, who's put themselves potentially like in a human form or body or something. Humanity are the best set to take their place as the dominant force. This ideology would soon be brought to all the scattered worlds of humanity in the long crusade that was yet to come. Now the official version of things tells how the last battle of the Unification Wars takes place on Mount Ararat. This siege to cleanse Sounds like uh, Diablo, Mount Ariat, where the World Stone was kept and destroyed at the end of Diablo 2. Spoils, I guess, if you haven't played Diablo 2. You know, that game came out a long time ago. I apologize with spoils, but yeah, it sounds like Mount Ariat. I wonder if they got that from name from the 40k universe. The Unification Wars takes place on Mount Ararat. This siege to cleanse the last of the techno-barbarians from the ruined wastes on Earth and finally bring it back to a time of peace and growth was said to be so brutal that waves of thunder warriors fell against the rocks and resistance were slain to a single man, the legendary warrior Arik Taranis, the lightning bearer. He would raise the banner of lightning to mark the end of the unification wars, setting in place the rule of the Emperor of Man, before he too would fall to fatal wounds suffered in this battle of legend. As with many things, the official version like is not the end of the story. The actuality of the event was darker and far more sinister. The Emperor knew that in order to restore peace 
growth and a sense of civilization to his new and expanding empire, he would require a more stable and balanced force than the Thunder Warriors, who were essentially just adept brutes recruited from the wasteland right, that he genetically modified the earliest Imperial armor. In a necessary betrayal, the Emperor realized that in order to safeguard what he had achieved, his army of barbaric fighters could not exist past this time. It is believed that he actually ordered the many Thunder Warriors who had survived the final battle to be slaughtered by his elite guard and possibly even some of the early proto-Astartes who were at this time far advanced beyond most of his standard force. This terrible secret has been concealed from the people of the Imperium for more than 10,000 years. I mean, I could see that being the case, you know, his idea for better humanity and they were just a tool to achieve his goals, you know, I mean, as, as shitty and as dark as that sounds, you know, it, it's a sound tactic and, and a sound strategy, you know, to take these. Instead of killing your enemy, if you can recruit them to your cause, you know, you're just gaining more numbers. So uh, taking these, you know, techno barbarians and turning them to your cause, genetically altering them to a point where they're superior to your enemies, but maybe not so superior that you can't control them, and then letting them loose against your enemies, killing the ones they need to, but possibly recruiting others. And then, you know, at the final battle, um, yeah, having their numbers dwindle down to a manageable number that you can deal with them, and then fighting them off because they are still just barbarians, and... Uh, you know, they're, they were born in a world where they knew nothing but fighting and killing and murder and other terrible, horrible things that, you know, can't really be said. So they don't have a place in the future of humanity. They don't have any honor. They don't have any, um, you know, want for scientific advancement. All they want to do is just fight and kill. Basically, they're just like human versions of orcs. I would assume so I could see why the emperor would want to yeah and get rid of them to create a better human and a better humanity for the future um because he knew what he, he, he you know the 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 emperor had been around long enough to where he's seen the peak of humanity and humanity at its best and this you know those techno barbarians would be a remnant of what the worst of humanity's potential could be. So he would want to clean the slate to start over, so to speak. So I, I could I could see that being, you know, a dark secret or truth, you know. And I honestly, like I said, you know, it's a very smart tactical move turning your enemies into, you know, willing soldiers, you know. This terrible secret has been concealed from the people of the Imperium for more than 10,000 years. And were it ever to be revealed, the consequences could be unimaginably disastrous. The Emperor, though, saw this necessary evil had to come to pass for the greater good. The yeah. sacrifice of the few to save the many who would come. The Thunder Warriors were built for war, and war alone, and would not be able to adapt to a time of peace, and could even have turned a vital tool into exactly. a dangerous, unstable threat yeah. that could unbalance all that he had because i mean if you left them alive and they procreated and stuff like that and those those barbaric ideas and war genes were taught to other generations eventually there could probably enough of them where it would cause another civil war and who knows where that would lead to you know turned a vital tool into a dangerous unstable threat that could unbalance all that he had achieved in order for the next stage of his plans, he also required that humanity rally behind him as the sole and most powerful force. The slaughter of the Thunder Warriors was not the last act of betrayal though by the Emperor. He would then take the necessary glory that he had near single-handedly reunified terror. This distortion of the truth, while hugely distasteful, does appear largely necessary. To reunite yeah, the whole of humanity that. and create the most powerful civilization in the galaxy. Gotta have one leader, one banner. Can't have, you know, people thinking otherwise. Nonetheless, should the truth ever arise, it would at best split apart the Imperium and at worst destroy it. So I'm wondering if that's part of what 
turned Horus. I'm sure there's probably, you know, obviously the influence of the chaos, you know, and, and stuff like that. But did Horus find a lot of that out? And knowing that being the case, did that lead to part of Horus's idea of like maybe, I, I don't know if this is Horus's idea, but like, will the Emperor betray us? He created us just like he created, you know, these you know, legions of the past that he used, are we just a tool to him? Is he going to betray us and kill us once we've served our purpose? You know, and maybe maybe that's what Horus thought, and that's why he turned on him. You know, I don't know. I will find out eventually as I read these books. ...ever arise, it would at best split apart the Imperium and at worst destroy it. These choices by the Emperor are important to remember in the context of his character, as it can lead to certain logical speculations regarding future events. Some Thunder Warriors though would find fate on their side and escape this mass killing and live on as homeless unknowns seeking out a miserable existence at the bottom of society. Honours forgotten, their deeds meaningless, all the while fearing constant discovery from the Imperium and certain death. This heartless betrayal was surely one of the darkest periods in Imperial history. They were never hunted though in any significant way. The Emperor believed them all dead and besides they were far more important tasks at hand as the Emperor now gathered a team of gene rights salvaged from the few remaining humans on earth. These were men with practical knowledge of genetics to aid in his development of the new Astartes project. Those Thunder Warriors who did escape were not like the Astartes of the 41st millennium. They were genetically unstable and most significantly they only had a minimally extended mortality beyond that of a regular human, unlike the space marines who can live on for thousands of years. The Emperor had been working for decades on his Astartes project deep within his mountain facility. Here he would create the vital foundations that would springboard humanity into a new age. His experiments would create the 20 Space Marine Legions, known as the Legiones Astartes, as well as 20 Primarchs to lead each Legion. These 20 supreme leaders of the soon-to-come Space Marine Legions were crafted by the Emperor using samples of his own arcane genetic code as the base. It is obviously unknown the depth of which the Emperor used his own DNA to create the Primarchs, but later findings through ancient Imperial records do hint that he spliced multiple DNA types together, even going so far as to introduce some animal DNA into the Primarchs. And this would explain why some such as Lehman Russ would display the wolf-like qualities right. and why these would then become present throughout the Space Wolves uh, Legion and Chapter. It's difficult to speculate on the Emperor's true goals here, and even if he was successful in the mixing of DNA in this way, it seems highly experimental, and perhaps he himself was not sure of the final result. This period... Yeah, could just be trial and error, trying to figure things out, and just, hey, it worked, you know, we'll keep them. Experimental, ...and perhaps he himself was not sure of the final result. This period of intelligent design was hasty and somewhat improvised given the dire situation facing mankind. It needed to repopulate its military power in order to springboard and take stage fights forward uh, to reconquer the colonies. Another point of speculation is how closely the Primarchs were imbued with spiritual elements and others such as unnaturally skillful charisma and so on. Still though, right. they Leadership qualities essentially is what I get from that. I mean, Leaders got to be charismatic, you know, you got to like a leader in order to follow them. I mean, I, I guess there's also the following, you know, through fear, but that usually doesn't last. ...and others such as unnaturally skillful charisma and so on. Still though, in creating the Primarchs and even taking small elements of the Emperor's DNA, it imbued them with these demi-godlike characteristics. It also explains why at this time the barely known forces of chaos would seek out and scatter the developing Primarchs before the Emperor's plans could grow into fruition. Little is known of this Primarch scattering event, but it has been suggested that the dawning forces of chaos felt this expanding power from humanity to threaten them, and in an effort to slow or negate it, they reached out into the mortal world to seize and scatter the fatal mm. Primarchs across the galaxy. So I wonder then, do the, do, you know, the chaos gods, do they see humanity as the greatest threat to them at that point? 
uh, you know, to go and, like, physically influence the uh, Primarchs and not having them be allowed, you know, to be raised by the Emperor himself after they were, you know, birthed or whatever genetically created, you know, whatever the process was. Um, yeah, that's that's just, that's interesting. It's an interesting idea, an interesting thought, you know, because then what would have happened you know where would humanity again another what if scenario what would have happened where would humanity be uh, you know would the horus uprising never have happened would they have never been able to would, would chaos never have been able to get its grip on any of the primarchs had they you know not been scattered and they were able to be properly i guess properly raised by the emperor with his you know ideals and thoughts or you know if the emperor saw something wrong with one of them you know killed him off and started over you know with with a different template until he perfected them i guess for for you know whatever his idea was for what he wanted to create but yeah i guess you know do the chaos demons see you know the primarchs and the emperor as the greatest threat you know to them and what you know, they would want to accomplish, I guess. Uh, and that's why they did that. You know, it's kind of interesting. The mortal world to seize and scatter the fetal Primarchs across the galaxy. Each world they found themselves on would surely in time come to realize that they were far from normal, often finding themselves as a natural leader in command of the systems that would become their home. Later, the Emperor would one by one discover and reunite the Primarchs with their legions, establishing one of the most powerful military forces the galaxy had ever seen. The Thunder Warriors though were undoubtedly the early prototypes for the Astartes project which subsequently makes their untimely end all the more tragic as their sacrifice was so great yet the memory of them was totally obliterated. Yeah. The Astartes project would continue in a pragmatic manner. Each of the early legions at this time contained barely a few hundred marines. Their equipment was lightweight and somewhat improvised by comparison to later standards. They trained their minds and bodies and I think will, might and rule things would always start, emperor. you know, things would obviously, you know, usually prototypes are imperfect and they get built upon, you know, as time goes by. So, yeah, I could imagine like, you know, the earlier armor was, you know, not as robust or, you know, able to deal with as much. Maybe they didn't have or need as much equipment uh, as they thought they would until, you know, they've gotten into certain battles and altercations and you know discovered they needed you know more equipment or more things to survive with etc 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 their minds and bodies to be the will might and rule of the emperor yeah i would assume their training is like you know take what the spartans did you know with their gogi and you know taking kids from the age of seven and training them to be perfect warriors you know, I would assume the, you know, Astartes training is like that times like 100, you know, just taking things to the absolute extreme, pushing them to the absolute limits, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, creating something of such great fortitude that, yeah, they wouldn't have any kind of comparison. And some bodies to be the will, might and rule of the emperor. Time would pass and their numbers grew. Each legion was divided not only for organizational reasons, but also for practical reasons. Because of their adapted genetics that were drawn from the Primarchs, some carried traits and psychological behaviors which would not have been found comfortable in comparison with their sibling legions. This segregation also allowed them to focus their bonds to their brothers in their own legion, creating a near unbreakable kinship between Astartes. If the newly created Astartes would be the Emperor's scalpel, his gleaming pinnacle of human achievement, then the Thunder Warriors were certainly a mace used to yeah, bludgeon the hammer. remnants of humanity back into submission. The Thunder Warriors were genetically stronger though, tougher, and could even be stronger in battle than the newly created Astartes, which is... It probably had to be back then though too, for the various conditions that were going on on Earth, and not to mention like... <laughs> The humans that probably survived going through the irradiated wastes or probably of a stock 
that yeah hadn't been seen before they they would have to be some some beefcake giga chads to be able to survive constantly constant infighting constant warfare constant lack of resources food water even you know clean breathable air so i i would assume that yeah that would be a logical case that a lot of the thunder warriors back then were probably even tougher and stronger than some of the present day astartes are would be and could even be stronger in battle than the newly created astartes which is something people often forget i would also assume that would probably make them harder to control which is again why the emperor would want to wipe them out they were a rough brutal instrument but ultimately a temporary solution to a violent problem the space marines would serve not only as a weapon but as beacons to mankind a glimmer of what right. humanity could the space marines are a symbol you know they're they're when when you know imperial guardsmen i'm sure are in a bad situation and they see a troop of you know space marines getting you know air dropped in that's like a beacon of hope. That's that's literal, like you know, angels on their shoulders coming in to to help you know stem the tide, push push back whatever they're fighting yeah, as against. A weapon, but as beacons to mankind, a glimmer of what humanity could hope to be. The dark times to come, however, would show that this was a misplaced belief. That while the space marines were created to represent the pinnacle of human development, they ultimately proved as susceptible to the basic flaws of mankind as any other mortal. The Emperor's humans are still humans. On Earth would now come to a close. He began establishing the fundamental elements of a civilized, modernized society in government administration, economy, and infrastructure. An important figure in this process was a man known as Malkador, the Sigilite. He had a vast knowledge of such matters and carried himself with the bearing of a priest. He was appointed to run the courts and palaces of the new empire, the right-hand man of the emperor. Earth returned from a place of desolation and horror to one of active production, rebuilding and planning. Some might call it coincidentally convenient, but at this time, a vast shockwave would travel through the galaxy the birth of Slaanesh. Humanity would have no idea of the significance of this, only that it cleared the storms from the warp that had isolated and ruined humanity's gloriously technologically advanced empire. Again though, we could speculate that the Emperor had foreseen these events and the necessity of preparing Earth for this time. On Mars, the humans of the cult Mechanicus, that is those who worship machines, would become aware of this unification on Earth, as information through distant communication and physical observations they viewed this new emperor as a man in alignment with their own agenda mars during the dark age of technology had been a planet with a single purpose a powerhouse of production for this age consolidating ships and weapons hmm. including the vast titans they were hundreds of feet tall gigantic bipedal war machines whose very presence could end conflicts before they began since the end of this age, cults had risen across the Mars, and the most prevalent of these was the Mechanicus, whose ideology included the veneration and acquisition of these ancient but highly advanced technologies from the period known as the Dark Age of Technology. During the period of isolation known as the Age of Strife, Mars had undergone a similar societal collapse comparable to that of Earth. With all trade cut off, they had insufficient water and food to supply the populace. A civil war would follow, as well as the collapse of some planetary infrastructures that shielded their little remaining hydroponics and food production systems. This would lead to a further collapse of the already fragile supporting systems. The techs and established Mechanicum decided the best way to survive this apocalypse would be to retreat into underground bunkers which had been mined out, creating vast cities below the surface. Little is known at this time, but evidently prior to their seclusion, the Mechanicum techs were a cult who would bear a respect and drive to recover, protect and utilize the lost technologies of mankind. Upon their rise from the subterranean depths, they had in this time translated this over into a complete faith. The tech priests of the Mechanicum, along with their troops, would very quickly subdue the insane irradiated savages who remained on the surface and begin the process of rebuilding and redeveloping Mars to be completely self-sufficient. So they kind of had the same historical event like he met and like, you know, Earth did. Only it wasn't necessarily, I guess, under the leadership of one all-powerful man like the Emperor. Um, 
I guess maybe it was just a group of people with a similar idea that, you know, rose to power and took out the other cults, you know, etc. Begin the process of rebuilding and redeveloping Mars to be completely self-sufficient. This, in combination with their access to some of the most powerful war machines ever forged in the galaxy, would without doubt leave the Mechanicus in a position of some power. To the cult of Mechanicus, who are now becoming aware of this emperor figure who had surfaced on Terra, a man of science and technology, this was obviously appealing to the Mechanicus, and some tech priests on Mars even began to suggest that the Emperor was a man of such power as to rival their own machine god and fulfill an ancient prophecy in their faith of techno-mysticism. Debates hmm. raged on Mars between the priesthood regarding how to treat this new development. All the while, the Emperor bearing his power of immense foresight would not be ignorant of the Mechanicum, and he slowly and steadily would begin to craft his new plans accordingly plans for a crusade on a galactic scale never before seen. Its purpose? To locate the lost Primarchs, to reunite the territories of humanity, forge a new Imperial Empire, and thrust the Imperium of Man into a position of complete dominance yeah. and power. Bring humanity to back to uh, the peak. The Emperor's plan was one of absolute submission. Anyone who stood against the Imperial Truth would be cleansed and destroyed. The Mechanicum of Mars were one of the few exceptions. The Emperor knew that any battle to try and claim dominance over the cult Mechanicum would be hugely counterproductive. Extremely costly. Even if he could claim victory over them, the cost to his new Astartes force would be yep. severe and unjustified. So he planned instead to offer a rare alliance with the Council of Tech Priests. In offering them assistance in their own goals and acquisitions of new and lost tech throughout the galaxy, they would provide support, construction of war gear, and tech to Imperial forces. They also were one of the exceptional entities to be allowed to maintain a state of semi-independence within the Imperium, a fairly unique position. The Emperor would also provide a new group of navigators to enable the Mechanicum to travel through the warp again in search of fabled STC units. All of this suited the Mechanicum and Imperium in a symbiotic relationship, and an alliance was created. And so we reach the beginning of Millennium 31. With Mars now allied to the Emperor's Imperium, the Legionis Astartes war machine had significantly expanded. The Mechanicum would provide the battle barges needed to transport the space marines throughout the galaxy. They also brought to the table the Titans, some of the most powerful war machines ever created. Their very presence on approaching a humanoid system would often be enough to prevent a conflict. The shock and awe of facing such incomprehensible opponents would quickly lead a populace to understand they had no hope of preventing the Imperial Expeditionary Force. Between the, the mechanized units and the Titans and the tanks and stuff like that, for, that the uh, Mechanicus are, are, are making, and then uh, seeing the Emperor and the Astartes and whatnot. Yeah, I, I would bet there would probably be little resistance and... I would bet a lot of planets would probably be down to just join them. Like, I mean, you have this this giant force that's willing to come in and start giving you support and aid and food and, you know, technology and better living conditions. And all you got to do is, you know, sign up with them. Sure. Quickly lead a populace to understand they had no hope of preventing the Imperial Expeditionary Forces from achieving their goals. The crusade would initially be led by the Emperor himself as he commanded a massive fleet of Astartes. As the crusade gathered pace and the Primarchs were recovered, these expeditionary fleets would number in the thousands. Before we talk about the crusade itself though, which I have tried to condense as much as possible, I want to first talk briefly on the Astartes or Space Marines. Now a regular misconception about Space Marines is that because they wear near identical armour and were originally produced via a variation of cloning or at least grown in a lab, 
that they somehow have no personality or little differentiation between them. It is also often assumed that space marines will blindly follow any commands given to the letter, no matter the consequences. After all, they are the superior, unquestioning warriors in the universe, right? Both of these myths is fundamentally wrong. Hmm. Each space marine is an individual person with their own character, traits, to an extent personal principles. I mean, the Primarchs are that way, so yeah, I never really thought that. I, I, the Primarchs are, you know, very much their own ind individual, you know, they're very much individuals with their own personalities and personality traits and ideals and goals, and that also, I would, you know, assume translate down into their legions that are kind of spin-offs of them, so... I never really thought that at all. I never even really heard that as, you know, uh a theory or misconception them following oil orders like pretty much without question i could see you know being the case but them not having like any kind of personalities of their own i would yeah it's not something i'd ever really heard of before individual person with their own character traits to an extent personal principles there are many documented events in which these human elements would have a role to play in subsequent events space marines although superhuman are still human and right. as such the emperor deemed it necessary to have a senior position with whom astartes could use as a point of reference to discuss matters of morality to understand their purpose their mission and sometimes to give guidance beyond purely military matters during the crusade and the expeditionary forces enter the iterators hmm. imperial iterators were the most persuasive of public speakers. They are masters of manipulating a crowd's opinion, and iterators would counsel also marines as they voyaged through the galaxy. But their role went beyond this and was critical at the inception of the Great Crusade. They were placed among the expeditionary forces to aid in reuniting humanity and turning lost human civilizations to the imperial cause. The emperor appointed them to spread the imperial truth truths such as the rejection of religious faith to enforce secular rule and unnecessary wasteful squabbling over power and resources these were all seen as significantly counterproductive and opposite to the objectives of the imperium the first yeah, primarch to be reunited with the imperial fleet was horus of the lunar wolves he greatly admired the iterator's work so much so that he asked them to also tutor his captains and legionnaires Horus believed that once the crusade was completed, there would be an end to the war and that the Astartes would first need to find a peacetime vocation. The most famous iterator during the Great Crusade was primary iterator Kyril Sindeman, who served aboard Horus's flagship. Iterators are seen as the precursors to Imperial Guard commissars and Astartes chaplains. The iterators and then later the chaplains are an example of the more human services required by space marines. Documented records have shown that they have been regularly known to question ethics, purpose and even their own morality despite an Astartes essentially being immortal. They are destined to die in battle as that is their true purpose. And despite this predefined fate, they are far from the emotion. Well, and I mean... If you live long enough, like if you're if you live thousands of years and your primary vocation is war and fighting, you're going to be in countless battles and eventually one of them you're going to you're going to get wounded or just outright killed. You know, I mean, it's one of those things of inev inevitability where it's, it's eventually just going to happen. I mean, I, but there's also to that point, you know, inevitable that it, it, some people are going to live through all those wars and not die, not get hurt, you know? So, I mean, yeah, there would have to be some kind of for, forethought or idea of, you know, what would these Astartes do and live like during a true time of peace, unless the Emperor plans to do to them what he did with uh, the the Thunder you know, guys, and just wipe them out and start over with a new version of humanity. You know, who knows? Their true purpose. 
and despite this predefined fate, they are far from the emotionless drones that some would assume. They are a living embodiment of humanity, a distillation of spirit and mind. The Emperor's great crusade to reunify humanity had begun in earnest. This was an operation on a truly epic scale. Millions of troops, tens of thousands of ships forged by the Mars Mechanicum. This would be humanity's defining moment, to reach out and forge the greatest empire in the galaxy. The Imperial forces comprised soldiers, naval officers, and most importantly, the Astartes legions. They were configured and divided into expeditionary fleets supported by all manner of cruisers, transports, scout teams, dropships, and so on. Commanded by the Emperor and his War Council, but also by individuals placed in charge of these expeditionary forces. It's important to remember that these forces were as much exploratory as they were tasked with an important mission. A great deal of time had passed during the Age of Strife, as well as incalculable quantities of data had been lost in the process. The Imperial forces simply didn't know exactly where all the colonies were, nor their status. Had they been destroyed in civil war, alien right. genocide, or perhaps the opposite, and expanded to a degree where they would not need aid, but... Yeah, I mean, who, for all they knew, there could have been other massive empires that could have happened. There, some of the colonies could have fell or fared extremely well with a lot of the technological advancements, and there could be even greater, more advanced, you know, civilizations of humanity that lived and that have, have expanded and that kept... The, that peak of technology, you know, who knows? They, they, they couldn't have known, I guess. So, I mean, yeah. Genocide, or perhaps the opposite, and expanded to a degree where they would not need aid, but instead submission. All of these were unknowns. Many locations could be estimated as to whether or not they had been colonized in the past. The Mechanicum could provide some information from past scripture as to where human colonies had been located, although more importantly, they wanted to know where we could find ancient and undiscovered technology. The expeditionary fleet would even initiate a search on the basis of myths and rumour. No stone was to be left unturned in the search for the lost civilizations of mankind. Before they embarked on their journey though, one other important task was required. Although the warp storms had subsided, allowing travel once again across great distances, the navigator class from the past that would guide ships through the warp. This system, though, was far from perfect, and the Emperor had a greater plan. On Earth, the Emperor ordered construction of the Great Astronomicon. Tech priests from Mars were drafted in to aid in this project, and its purpose would be to enable the Emperor to guide, oversee, and command his vast fleet all from Terra. It created a okay. system for him to focus, amplify, and broadcast psychic signals and energy. It would stand as an unchanging marker, a lighthouse for the navigators, a point of reference around which they could plan all their travels. This certainly was an important factor in the success of the crusade as it enabled the navigators to travel through the warp in great leaps and faster than they ever had done before. In addition to this, the Emperor would also create the Astropaths. These were powerful psychers whose sole task would be in relaying communications from the fleet and later the established Imperium back hmm. to the ruling council on Terra. I'd never heard of them the vast before. vast distances involved meant that the astropaths would become the only communication link between Terra and the distant colonies. However, as with the Eldar, the risk of possession to the astropaths by war great. demons consuming the psychers and thereby enabling them to travel into the material world was one that the Emperor was all too aware of, especially after his Primarchs had been scattered throughout the galaxy. To this end, the astropaths would undergo an extreme and harsh process of toughening against the threat of warp entities. The Emperor himself would manipulate and reform their mind into a protective vessel, Damn. making them nearly immune to risks from the warp. This process, though, was agonizing and extremely dangerous. Many psychers were killed in the process. I would bet, yeah. completely insane. Even if they survived the process, a universal effect would see their optic nerves become damaged beyond repair. This meant all astropaths are blind. Fine, yeah. From the Imperial perspective, though, this was a necessary consequence as they continued to be an integral part of Imperial infrastructure. The Crusades had begun, and alongside Space Marines were hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Imperial troops, humans who were salvaged from the aftermath of terror.
seems like there's a, a ton of things in the 40k universe that are um kind of given a blind eye to i guess is, is the phrase i'm looking for just because it's for the greater good you know what i mean uh and i guess to an extent that could be a good enough excuse because i mean like you look at what's going on in the universe with tyranids and necrons and eldar and orcs and chaos marines and chaos demons and you know gene stealer cults and all that kind of stuff man like there's all kinds of bad shit going on out there so I guess you gotta some sacrifices like like I said are need to be made for the greater good you know not millions of imperial but then it also we get into questions of morality and is what is the greater good if we're you know giving up parts of our humanity you know what are we sacrificing you know what i mean you know we get into those kind of discussions Truth. humans who were salvaged from the aftermath of terror and structured into an effective albeit expendable fighting force this imperial guard was strengthened and resupplied as they reconnected and conquered lost human colonies a secondary benefit was that in drafting local military forces into the expeditionary force it removed these planets ability to rebel effectively against the newly created imperial outposts on each planet also, in these early days, taxes and tribute to the Imperium were not strictly required, but Imperial commanders stationed on new colonies of the Imperium would often require supplies for the continuing crusade. Many systems and colonies would need help rebuilding or periods after generations of schooling by iterators to bring them in line and around to the Imperial truth and loyalty to the Imperium. Some worlds, though, who were self-sufficient had survived intact and would even welcome the arriving Imperial forces right. with open arms as long-awaited That's what brothers, I was saying. with glorious celebrations and immediate support, much to the satisfaction and pride of the expeditionary forces who were all too happy to welcome their brothers back to the Imperium. Such events were a blessing to behold, though, as many worlds were either barren wastes long since destroyed with only right. ruined remains to prove that anyone had ever existed there. Or they were found to be locked in brutally tyrannical dictatorships and required sometimes days, often weeks of orbital and ground assault to subdue and conquer these false dictators. Religious doctrine and faith were especially highlighted to be crushed on all worlds. The Emperor would never allow these practices to infringe or threaten the Imperium as he was partly responsible and had even seen the effects these caused on humanity millennia ago in the first age of mankind. The Emperor also made an important choice that upon arrival to New Worlds, any psychers discovered were told to expect transport back to Terra, courtesy of secretive black ships. Here they would be tested hmm. on their journey back to Earth to their limit. They would endure nightmarish examination, some dying from the trials or executed for being just too unstable. Others though ended up completely losing their minds in the process of these harsh examinations. The fate of these individuals was at the time unknown. It later transpired that if they were proven strong and capable enough in manipulating their psychic power, they would become stock for creating new astropaths by the Emperor. Any younger but highly powerful psychers were subsequently distributed to some of the Space Marine Legions who had begun a librarius program, creating Probably special the Grey Knights who were capable of wielding immense psychic power. Others, though, disappeared from record entirely, leading to supposition of secret organizations who even today are not fully disclosed. The Crusade continued for centuries, stretching out across the galaxy. Finally, the Primarchs were reunited with their legions and were duly given positions on the Crusade and Imperial War Council. The Primarch figures, though, were not suited to this level of administration. They were at their best out among their Marines leading campaigns. Right. So it fell to the administrators of Man to run the day-to-day -day Crusade infrastructure. One important figure arises again, that of Malkador the Sigilite. He would become a keystone in the execution of the Crusade and one of the most loyal and valuable members of the Imperial Council. The power of the Imperium had now reached its peak. There seemed to be little, if anything, that could threaten, damage or destabilize the glory and power of the now reunited Imperium of Man. The Crusade had in fact been so successful that after a chain of impressive victories, the Emperor decided he could fully return to Terra to continue managing his plans there and working on new secret projects. 
his Primarchs were surely more than capable of finishing the now simple task of scouting and securing any fringe colonies and bringing the Crusade to a successful conclusion. After a specifically great victory on Ulanor, the Emperor selected the first Primarch and commander of the Lunar Wolves, known as Horus Lupercal, and bestowed upon him the title of War Master. This title established him as a leader of the Imperial military forces in lieu of the Emperor, and all other Primarchs and Imperial forces would follow the War Master's commands as if they were the Emperor's. Not all the other Primarchs seemed to be entirely comfortable, not only with this decision, but also with the Emperor's choice bet. to leave them and return to Terra. I would bet, yeah, I would bet some some of them would probably be jealous or envious of that, wanting to be that themselves, um, and would probably cause, yeah, some, some infighting and other instabilities. And yeah, obviously they would want to have the Emperor there fighting alongside them because they would want to prove themselves to the Emperor, I, I would assume, too. Not only with this decision, but also with the Emperor's choice to leave them and return to Terra. Considering their strength of character, this seems somewhat surprising, but if anything, it shows that their bond they shared with the Emperor was perhaps not rock solid, and some right. of them felt bewildered he should choose to leave them on the fringes of the galaxy, when overall victory seems so near and so secure. I also feel like that's probably part of the issue of what happened with them being scattered, because they weren't, like... There weren't, you know, who knows what kind of upbringing they really had. If they had any kind of parents or, or not, or if they just, you know, survived on their own, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it again goes back to the question of what another what if, you know, if they hadn't been scattered and they had been raised, you know, uh, by the emperor the way the emperor had intended, you know, how would they have turned out, how things would have been different. Um, you know, had the Hor would the Horus, you know, rebellion have even happened? Um, would the Emperor potentially have killed some of them off, seeing them as imperfect, and, you know, created other ones, you know, etc, etc, etc. On the fringes of the galaxy, when overall victory seems so near and so secure. Horus, whilst being a supreme master of military matters, was also less well known for being exceptionally tactful and charismatic. He would take time to speak to each of his brother Primarchs in turn, understanding them as he did, he would employ his various skills of perception and charisma to appeal to their individual natures and reassure them that although the Emperor had granted him this glorious honour, it was the Brotherhood together who would achieve the ultimate victory. This helped quell some of the disquiet, but it was not only the Primarchs who felt bemused that the Emperor had abandoned them, and in time, this, in combination with other unfortunate events, would lead to the darkest of catastrophes. In fact, there have been many examples throughout human history where withholding information would lead to disaster. Yeah. And this period for humanity would be no exception. The Emperor's decision to not make his space marines aware of the dark forces of chaos for their own benefit. In fact, even to this day, the vast majority of the Imperial citizenship lives blissfully unaware of the darkness that lies in the Imperial. Yeah, I don't even know about it. The Emperor's precise reason the dangers for this is crystal clear. Perhaps he felt that humans were too easily persuaded or tempted by the promises of quick, easy power. But whatever the reason, the consequences for the Primarchs and Space Marines to not be able to see this danger, as well as the Imperium, would be disastrous. You know, I, I would assume his thinking is probably because they're so powerful that he would want them being tempted by, you know, chaos and exploring it more. But, uh, you know, the another idea is, you know, the warp is influenced by the thoughts and emotions and feelings of the people in the material realm. You know, so not thinking about it could potentially revert some of that, you know what I mean? Uh, maybe that was part of what he was thinking, part of his whole idea of not telling them was that, you know, if they're unaware of it, maybe they won't influence it as much. Space Marines to not be able to see this danger as well as the Imperium would be disastrous. The Astartes legions had encountered vague clues and shrouded warnings on some lost human worlds they encountered. Whispers in the wind, apparent possession of marines. Horus and his lunar wolves discovered direct evidence of some dark force when they encountered a lost but highly advanced human colony known as the Interrex in the later stages of the Expeditionary hmm. Crusade. 
As the fleet travelled to the Interrex homeworld, they engaged in extended peaceful negotiations. Again, this was an example of the Space Marines and notably Horus not giving preference to immediate combat, but in choosing a peaceful option if this was viable to them, it was always preferable. Their mission of Imperial Truth was without question, it was the only resolution that would ever be acceptable to the fleet though. Now during this encounter, Garviel Loken, who was the Lunar Wolves 10th captain and a member of the Mournival, uh, the Mournival was a close and under Imperial rule illegal clique of brothers, but one which Horus had allowed to exist so as to help advise him on matters of importance. Loken was among the Warmaster's party when they attended a reception with these Interrex during negotiations. He was drawn into a casual conversation with one of the Interrex guard who admitted that the Interrex had learned to tread carefully with any newcomers to their people because they feared the taint of chaos with a K on oh. the newcomers. It becomes apparent that the Interrex colony had made dealings with the Xenos race, the Eldar, during the Age of Strife and the Interrex explain how it is their understanding from what they could discern from the Elder that Chaos is a threat like no other, that it would not appear brutal or blunt at first, but subtly. They feared Chaos deceptively approaching their space, posing as a friend, seeking to bleed its way into their confidences and then destroy them mercilessly from the inside out. Loken was shaken at these unknown revelations and the Warmaster Horus would later assure him that there is no fundamental evil in the galaxy, and that is the end of the matter. But the seeds of suspicion are planted. Loken cannot shake this feeling that something, somewhere, is wrong. But before he'd have any opportunity to follow up and explore these doubts, a break-in occurs in one of the Intrex's most sacred museums, and a highly advanced blade known as an anatheme is stolen. At this time, despite Horus's pleas for restraint, negotiations would now collapse and the Lunar Wolves and the advanced Interrex would fall into all-out conflict. The Space Marines of Horus are ultimately victorious over the Interrex, but it's a victory Horus takes no pleasure in, as it's born out of misunderstanding bet, yeah. and was a tragic, unnecessary conflict. These events though would become just a singular fragment in a deteriorating pattern of troubles that would haunt and gesticulate within Horus, as well as his unease then irradiating out into his brother Primarchs, the Mournival, his and other legions. Unbeknownst to Horus, a sequence of events had been now initiated and their cascade could not be prevented. So why are these events so important? Well for one, it gives more insight into the fact that at the time, it seems barely any Space Marines at any level of rank had any knowledge of Chaos. And if they did, it was only the vaguest of suspicions, the kind that could easily be brushed off by speaking to say some iterators. They had no idea about the true nature or capabilities of the malevolent force known as Chaos. By comparison, the Emperor understood all too well the dark forces that had very recently annihilated the Eldar and consumed so many human colonies throughout the Age of Strife. Obviously you wouldn't want that it's to happen on to he humanity. Would not to gift his Astartes and more importantly his Primarchs with this information so that they could best protect against its darkness. But perhaps he feared that knowledge of the warp entities would do more harm than good instead right. choosing ignorance as the best policy. However, a combination of time, doubt, rejection, jealousy, and greed brewing in corners of the Astartes legions would prove this to be an unwise decision. To be continued. And does he have anything at the end here? No, he doesn't. Okay. All right. Well. There you guys have it. That is part one of the Emperor of Man, the Rise of Humanity, Warhammer 40,000 lore and history. I'm going to try to wrap this up quick because this is an extremely long video. His video is already long and then my pausing and asking questions and talking and making comments made it even quite longer. Um, so it, it's very interesting to me, though, that at one point in time, humanity's technology was so peak that the other races out there didn't even want anything to do with this and that they even the orcs signed non-aggression packs that to me is is fascinating that we were that that advanced that we've risen to that peak we were literally the top dog of the galaxy 
for a time period and we were like the youngest race there that to me is so fascinating um and yeah the just the the that whole history time period of things coming beforehand and and then you know falling to the age of strife starting with the the ai uprising and then the warp being so turbulent because of all stuff the eldar was doing then you know the emperor creating the thunder legion and ultimately having to kill them because they were probably too brutal and too barbaric too primitive for what his vision of humanity wanted to be um and then yeah it's interesting that he didn't tell anyone about the forces of chaos probably because he thought ignorance was bliss and probably because uh he felt like uh if they didn't know about it they probably wouldn't influence it because you know he had always deemed the that chaos and was the greatest threat to humanity so anything that could undermine that you know would obviously you know benefit them it's also again the one of the biggest what if questions that i have and i've already said it but i'm gonna repeat myself is just how would things be different and you know with the primarchs had they had actually been raised by the emperor from birth instead of being scattered you know how much stronger would they be would these primarchs even still be the primarchs would he have you know potentially saw some flaws in them killed them started over again with you know different ones to perfect them maybe a little more maybe maybe made them more prepared to fight you know off uh chaos and and things like that you know but it's all just very fascinating very fascinating history and i'm looking forward to getting into part two and uh, i believe part two is probably more of getting into uh the horus heresy and stuff so um like i said this video is already very long so i'm just trying to wrap it up quickly thank you guys very much if you if you sat through this whole video with me um thank you guys very very much for sticking around here all the way to the end it means a lot um you know let me know down in the comments you know whatever questions i asked feel free to answer them in any way shape or form um like i said earlier this my my channel is probably going to go quiet for the next few days as we are celebrating thanksgiving here in the states uh if you are celebrating thanksgiving i hope you have a wonderful thanksgiving with your family stay safe safe travels all that good stuff hope you have a wonderful time um there might be some streams you know a couple of days but i don't know if there's going to be any you know videos or uploaded for the next few days until the weekend starts we got uh book one of the horror series that we're going to start reading i'm going to get some stuff up for that as soon as i can so uh yes thank you guys very very much appreciate you appreciate all the love and support lately if you enjoyed the video consider leaving a like and a sub as it does help me and helps the channel grow and i hope wherever you are and whenever you're watching this that you're having a wonderful day uh thank you guys again very much have a good one everybody and i'll see you on the next one